observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, and still undefined, don't quite know what it means, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett. And as always, I am Robcasting it. You, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this the post-geek singularity community. This is Rob's Evasions, episode number 730. I have a special episode today. I have Eisner Award-winning comic writer, director, filmmaker, Mr. Paul Jenkins with me. And we are going to discuss his new crowdfunded documentary, Into the Wormhole, that is crowdfunding now. It's going to be one of a series of documentaries that pulls the lid off of everything from toxic fandom to basically why are we at each other's throats why is everyone so angry well this particular segment of the documentary focuses on a specific fan film project that i was involved with it goes all the way back well it goes back before i was involved with it but my involvement happened in the year 2014 and the project is overall known as Axenar, but in 2014, I was recruited by my good friend Christian Gossett. Um, you might know him from doing his amazingly superlative work on comics that he created, like the Red Star. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, he actually created the double-bladed lightsaber. And he and I both worked in the industry. Funny story, I was working on the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Back in 2005, I was in New Zealand, and Richard Taylor himself brought me into a secret room at the Weta Workshop, where there were all these amazing designers doing all kinds of secret shit no one could know. And who was in there? Christian Gossett. And he jumps up, he's like, Rob, what are you doing here? I go, what are you doing here? There we were, two industry professionals with bona fides meeting in a secret room at Weta, Di actually this is Weta Workshop, not Weta uh, Digital. So he asked me to work on a Star Trek fan film called Prelude to Axnar, which was going to be a proof of concept for a larger fan, a Star Trek fan feature called Axnar. And it was the brainchild of a guy named Alec Peters, who I didn't know, but I knew of him because he had been involved with the Stargate auctions and put on the huge Battlestar Galactic auction. I knew he was a big Star Trek fan, but I really didn't know much about him. And Christian introduced me, and it was his idea. And they were going to do a story about a conflict the Federation had with the Klingon Empire. And this was loosely based on the FASA Four Years War idea from the FASA Star Trek role-playing game. And for whatever reason, Alec Peters was inexplicably obsessed with Steve Inhat's character, Garth of Izar, who was in an episode of the third season of Star Trek. And I mean, not even the first or second seasons. This was a third season episode. Uh, whom Gods Destroy, and Garth of Izar was a once-decorated Star Trek captain, uh, Starfleet captain, who had presumably gone insane when he learned the powers of shape-shifting. I didn't really understand why this person, Alec Peters, loved this character then. I do know that. I know now, though. Uh, but to show you what we were involved with before I bring in Paul Jenkins, I'm going to show you the sizzle reel. By the way, I edited Prelude to Axanar. I oversaw the post-production of it, and everything to do with Prelude to Axanar, I finished it. I carried it over the finish line. I did a lot of work. I also was on set the two days of principal photography. I did an entire 45-minute documentary that I've since expanded. According to Alec, I don't do any work, and according to Alec, I was the only person on the project that was never paid, but that's neither here nor there. We'll get into that later, but to show you all what this is, I'm going to show you the sizzle reel that I created, this was after we had shot Prelude to Axanar, and uh, these are unfinished effects. People that know Prelude to Axanar, you're going to see some effect shots that didn't make it into the finished version of the movie. But this was a sizzle reel we did that gives you a, an idea of where we were going. And the idea was it was going to be a documentary style based on Band of Brothers, a documentary style movie set canonically about 20 years before... Kirk and Spock were both on the Enterprise together. Interestingly enough, 
Star Trek Discovery did the same thing. Its first season, it went back and detailed a Klingon conflict with the Federation as well. That was, of course, years after Prelude Daxnar. I guess great minds think alike. But without further ado, here is the sizzle reel that I created in May of 2014. To give you a timeline, the film was shot uh, at the end of April, beginning of May, I think. Two days of principal photography, one day of pickups. I edited the film from May to July, and it had its debut at the San Diego Comic-Con of 2014. So all in, soup to nuts, from the time the money was raised, crowdfunding, we raised $100,000, to the time it was finished was three and a half months. And I think that's a really important thing. So here is the sizzle reel that I created for Prelude to Axanar. This was dated May 17th, 2014. Uh, this is, of course, the disclaimer that Paramount has everyone who's making Star Trek fan films put on the front of their film. We are facing an enemy that is consumed and committed to our total destruction. An enemy that demands to be fought. And we will fight. But I say to you, our greatest challenge is not the might of a Klingon fleet. The greatest challenge laying before us is to do what must be done without undoing the dream of the Federation. His first speech to the Federation Council was incredible. There were 40,000 people in Archer Arena. The old man himself was there, and they all wanted one thing, hope. The first goal was to create a class of ship that could spring Starfleet back into action, back into battle. We had to leapfrog Klingon technology. We had over a dozen member worlds working on it. It was the first pure warship that Starfleet had ever built. Well, that was Ramirez's first roll of the dice, and they landed exactly the way we wanted them to, the way we needed them to. At that point, about the only thing we were doing that impressed the Klingons was dying well. It wasn't until the formation of the Federation that the High Council began to take Earth seriously. Before then, the incidents with Captain Archer were dismissed as a nuisance. And even after the Federation was formed, many on the High Council thought it as a mere political alliance. Starfleet was never seen as a match for the Imperial Navy. Certainly not one that would impede the growth of the Empire. The bad blood between the humans and the Klingons meant that the job of preventing war and leading the peace delegations fell to Vulcan. Regrettably, we failed. Goddamn Inverness 5. Day after day, it was the same thing. I get called in to support some kind of counterattack. By the time I got into orbit, my orders had been changed. Attack called off. Battle was already over. We'd pull out of warp into a junkyard. Karn. Vulcan intelligence is, if I may say, unparalleled, but even for us, he was a mystery. After the battle of Cygnus III, our ship captains finally started giving the Federation its due as a worthy adversary. But in the two years we wasted in our arrogant belief we were superior to the Federation, we had lost the advantage. With the launch of their newer ships and the experience their commanders had gained, our progress was slowed. Now the D7 would be needed to break the back of Starfleet. The D7 was the ultimate expression of the Klingon warship, technologically superior to anything in the Quadrant. We had three shipyards across the Klingon Empire building her. 
we would launch her and devastate the Federation fleet. Axanar was the bloodiest conflict in the Federation's short history. We didn't sign up to be warriors. That's not what Starfleet's about. We proved that we could do what we needed to do to defend the Federation. I'm proud of everyone who I served with, especially those that didn't make it back. For myself, I have but one fear. Destroying the dream of the Federation. Compared to such a loss, I do not fear the Klingon Empire. Ah, those were the days, weren't they, Paul Jenkins? Allow me to give a warm observations welcome to Eisner Award-winning writer Paul Jenkins, who once again joins us here on Raw Observations. Paul Jenkins now knows more about this entire project than I ever could have known, things I didn't know, things I shouldn't have known. Paul has uncovered all of them. So, Paul, welcome to Raw Observations. Now that everybody has sort of a uh, a, a bit of a starting, a jumping off point, as it were. Um, tell us, what are you up to with this documentary, Into the Wormhole, and what does it have to do with Prelude to Axnar, Axnar, and its, well, I would call him as yet to succeed fan film producer Alec Peters? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, what you just showed is the heady days of when things were great, right? You know, it's beautiful and it looks good and it's... it's uh, And that was all was unfinished a, effects other than the space yeah. shots, all the backgrounds yeah. and... But it was it was when Axanar was the promise. It almost, it almost spoke to the prelude to Axanar as the promise of hope, right? <laughs> and that, that, that there would be something great and it would live in the in the Star Trek universe. And, and uh, you know, it was clearly something that generated a lot of buzz and a lot of, you know, great people worked on the project. It looked really good. It felt great, you know. And so all of this in a fan film in, in, a, in a, a crowdfunded fan film. Um, fantastic, right? What could possibly go wrong? What, you know, the, what, what was interesting too, like I was, I, I got involved with it because Christian Gossett asked me and I had nothing but uh, great respect for Christian. You mm -hmm. know, as a creative entity, he, first of all, he's a great, personally, he was a great guy. There was, you, you couldn't be around somebody who's more fun to hang out with. He's so funny and so witty and, and uh, also uh, just an incredibly talented artist. I mean, I know you know his comic, The Red Star. He'd worked for other, other companies as an artist, but The Red Star really was something that he wrote and created. And he was just a really vibrant, I was, he still is. We're both working on Netflix animated shows now. But right. he was just a vibrant, creative entity. And so when he asked me, to come work on this project i was thrilled i'm like mm -hmm. dude you want me to work on your project for you Psh, sign me up yeah and you should have been i mean it, you know it has the promise of being fantastic and wonderful and uh, you know a great set and and uh there was some f really really seasoned actors in there and and you know it was in it was in the right place right and um really the story of what we're doing with into the wormhole is we're, we're taking a look at what happens when toxic fandom kind of breaks the things that we love you know what happens when we have all of these things as star trek or doctor who or, or pick one and they're, they're torn apart now by toxic fandom now people have all kinds of different definitions about what toxic fandom really is you know you could say well it's someone who disagrees with me and that's hardly the point <laughs> Okay. We under vive la difference, right? We understand that people don't agree about whether or not this is good because good is subjective. There's no such thing as good. It's all subjective. Um, it's one of my actual particular quirks, by the way, is that uh, I've been lucky enough in my career to have both won awards and been nominated for awards. And um, with the exception of, of one that I was dragged to, I've never been to an awards ceremony. There's a particular reason for it. I believe it's subjective and I don't believe that I feel like going to an evening of self-congratulation and backslapping that's just not for me right so is it is it right is it the best is it the correct version well we love the debate don't we rob it's, it's half of what you do on your show is it not that you you talk about whether whether this is the the one that you like or whether you wish it had been a different thing yeah yeah no absolutely but i i mean as people tell you i do think there there is objective greatness to things 
Now, mm-hmm. whether we recognize that, because people always say, I do think, though, that there is an, there's a reason why Shakespeare's stories are still being told. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, his his stories have human truths in them that are transcendent of time. But I think those things are self-evident. While we can debate the merits of Shakespeare, his stories have endured. And- his stories have endured, but, you know, what endures, okay? The, the, the brilliance of Ju- Julius Caesar, right? But, you know, Troilus and Cressida was written for the court. It was crap, right? right? A little pot boy that he wrote to make, a, to make a bit of money, right? So it's not, you know, not all of it is great. It's through the, the lens through which we see it. Absolutely. And, and so that's a factor as well, right? So to, you know, to clarify, you know, we're talking about fandom and fan has a number of connotations. It is short for fanatic. Let's not forget it. So at times people can have a certain air of fanaticism. I'm not, I'm not a big fan guy. I don't particularly have many things that I, I, I gravitate towards with fandom. Um, I got my football team in England. I happen to be a Crystal Palace fan in the Premier League. Oh, well, that's my team, right? You know, you follow them. You grow up. Why? Because I grew up with my family being Palace fans and we, we're brought into it. It's, for those of you uninitiated, it's a bit like being a Cleveland Browns fan. So it's not so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, we are all we are all fans at times, right? Now, am I a big fan of a show? Maybe, maybe not, right? I'd be very interested to meet Patrick Stewart and say, "Hey, man, how you doing?" I, I, I'm not really going to fawn on anybody, right? Had you introduced me to Neil Armstrong, or Ali, or perhaps the Dalai Lama, I might be somewhat impressed. You know, I might I'd be very interested and worried about how the conversation would go, right? So I think if you if you look at it and we um, we look at the concept of fandom, it's about our shared joy and our love for things we hope. Yeah. And there can be disagreements, but it can't all be disagreements, can it, Rob? It has to be that we're looking at a thing that we recognize. And as you say, that's more of an objective view of something like Star Trek which has a body of work that has over the years become something extremely valuable to people. Yes. Yeah. Now what happens when you have people inside that realm who come in and they are the bad actors? That's what we're beginning to look at because as you look at fandom now with what's happening with social media, what's what's happening with anybody's ability to come in and attack, what we have found is a group a group or groups of people that don't come in any, they're not even just disagreeable. There are certain things that are happening right now that are really attacking fandom. And, you know, we, we as like you, uh, you were the second director. Uh, Christian was the first. I was the third. And you and myself and Christian have a shared experience. The shared experience that we have is that we are all liars. We are all thieves. We are all lazy. <laughs> and it's what I just wrote about, right? Is, is anybody in my realm or sphere were you to explain to them that I was somehow lazy or didn't do the work, they would spit up their drink because yes. of all things, whatever I might be, I'm probably one of the hardest working people that delivers their content. And I have only ever been thus. And so, you know, a lot of times people get emails from me at four o'clock in the morning because I've just like taken one for the team and sent them their stuff. And yet you, myself and Christian were all described that way. And I just wrote about this in our, in our ongoing blog on Into the Wormhole. We were, we were described that There's way. There's a link, we, by the way, in the description below this video. You can find Paul's link to both Into the Wormhole and his most recent blog. And why, why were we described that way? And it's actually the focus of the next blog that I'm going to do, Rob, is because discrediting your enemies comes with a series of techniques right? You, you sanctify your supporters, you demonize your enemies. And this is the way that these things work. So within the framework of Axanar, here you have this incredible film, something that was really wonderful. And by the way, in a, in a couple of minutes, I want you to remind me of something, if you don't mind, if you can no, remember. Not at all. It was a... Uh-oh. Come back, Paul. Uh, he'll come back. Oh, well, Oh, you're See, back. Okay, there, I'm back. You're back. I, I, you're may back. Have, I may have jumped off. Um, there was a very, very interesting part. They're trying the to silence you, Paul. <laughs> um, where, when this first started happening to me, it had already happened to you. It had already happened to Christian. It apparently happened, you know, where we ran afoul of Axanar's self-styled leader, leader uh, Alec Peters. You know, when it started happening to me, I was very surprised by elements of it. 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and one of them was that he very quickly started talking about how much I hated Prelude to Axanar, which was a, a, a mildly sort of impossible situation because I, I agreed to sign on because it was so fantastic. I liked Prelude to Axanar so much that I wanted to be involved. And so the idea that I would just particularly kind of spew dislike or hatred um, was, was never true because I liked it. But what I realized was happening, and I had actually seen this, and as we've worked on this documentary, we've uncovered this stuff, is how many times uh, Alec Peters will talk about you and Christian being divided. You didn't like Christian's work. You did it all. Christian didn't like your work. Christian doesn't like me. Christian's a better, uh, uh, Christian's uh, a much better comic book creator than I am. Uh, you, so are you, Rob. You know, and so this whole thing of like dividing people and trying to. <laughs> yeah, yes, cool Eisner people. Award winner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, yeah, now has, uh, and so one of the, we look at these series of techniques that are used by demagogues, by narcissists. Um, um, you know, they're used by cult leaders. And so it sounds like hyperbole. And yet look at this, Rob. These are the same sets of techniques that are used by these people. And here we are in a in a small fan film that really should just mean joy and love and, and accomplishment. And yet there's this massive pile of toxicity. And that's really what we're looking at is how does this happen? And, and why does it happen? And how do these bad actors use certain techniques to manipulate people into their way of thinking? Well, you know, to me, it's what I find really interesting and, and specifically about, about Alec Peters is anyone who is a creator loves the process of creating. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, when you're writing or Christian's drawing or, or I'm working on a film, we love the process. Like, I can sit, when I get in front of a computer and start editing, 12 hours will go by in the blink of an eye as I'm completely engaged creatively. Well, there's a lot of people that are not creators and they don't create, but they want to get involved in things because they want the accolades that the finished product will bring them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I, I think to me, Alec Peters is a, because I met other people like that, he's a perfect example of that. He had no interest in the process, nor did he want to learn about the process. He just wanted to be at the head of it, the head of the table, and, and he wanted everybody to come to him. He wanted to be sort of at the center of the maelstrom. And yet he really didn't have anything to offer. And that's not to say he wasn't dumb. Like he, he, because he was into the prop world, he did things like finding costumes and he really knew his stuff. So he, he, there was a part he had to play, but as a leader, as a figurehead, the person that he wanted to be, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be at the top of that pyramid and he wanted everyone to come to him, but he didn't know what he was doing. So coming to him was uh, always a hindrance. And yeah, I think he, there was one, okay, sorry, well, buddy, I was going to say, I think there was one thing that, that we noted that I think you had noted and Christian had noted to me at one point, um, which I found fascinating, that this one particular individual who had been around at least two productions that I was aware of, uh, that would have been Christian's production and your production of the, uh, the Klingon scene, the, the, uh, the Vulcan, the scene. Vulcan scene, sorry. Um, he had been around them and when he was on our set had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of how this was done and so that's a very interesting kind of situation because one of the things that we just wrote about in the in the blog that we have the latest one is about discrediting people right and and one of the ways in which he had discredited me was to say i was clueless i had no idea i had no experience i didn't know what to do and i'm like you know that that's fine but you do have you realize you you know you're saying that about someone who's been nominated for not one but two BAFTA awards, who's won an ISO. You know, there's a certain element of verifiability about these things. That um, I think there was a, a, a piece of footage that I found of, of Alec Peters uh, talking about Christian, in which he's saying, "Well, you know, Christian, you just need to shut up because you're clearly you're upset because your career is going nowhere." And of course, at that very moment, you know, Christian's career is really, really taking off. So there's this very curious thing about these people, you know, how is it that they, they don't even care about the verifiability of something that they say, you know, it's clearly not true. But you see, Rob, I think we're talking about reality versus perception. Yes. Perception is reality to everybody in the world. And if their supporters or even their own uh, need for self-validation, if they perceive themselves to be the hero and the other person to be demonized, they're winning in in their mind and and so it doesn't matter about the truth no i i think in 
look, one of the things that I, I, I give Alec Peters all the credit in the world for was he found a lot of good people like mm -hmm. Christian to mm -hmm. hire on and realize his dream of making this movie. Mm -hmm. And that's what a great producer does. A great producer might have a project, but they know that they can't realize it. So they go and they get all these good people. They stand back. They let the great creative people do what they do. And then if the project, the product turns out to be great, then they take all the credit, which is exactly what they should, absolutely what they should do. And the, the funny thing that happened on the Axonar project, when Prelude was done, everyone loved it. I mean, I have to say, even I, as I was working on it, sitting there for the first time, and I was the one that brought it to San Diego to show, when I saw that on a gigantic theater screen, with that sound system, even though I worked on every single bit, I had a lot of creative leeway. I, there was a lot of me that I was able to put in that film. Uh, and to see the performances that, I mean, Christian, when he was directing the movie, he actually was a character himself. You didn't see him, but he played the interviewer. He put himself in the interviewer of this documentary. And when right. he was when he was asking, I mean, he literally was playing a character which allowed the actors to get those performances and he helped them get yeah. there. And it was a really great way to direct a faux documentary as the I'd documentary. Like I'd like to comment on that. I'd love to comment on that particular thing because I think this was one of the things that was really fascinating to me. Um, I was asked in a recent interview, I was asked about what were the parts of this experience, you know, because obviously now I, like you, like Christian, like Christian was a director on the project, found himself and left the project, found himself in the middle of a lawsuit. You know, you were a director on the project, found yourself in the middle of a lawsuit. I'm a director on the project find myself in the middle of a lawsuit. I think there might be a common denominator here, right? <laughs> and so people were asking me this question when you knew, and, and I was asked this question because I, I really actually kind of wanted to answer it. What, what surprised me about this situation? Being on, I'm 32 years in this business, man. I started as the third employee of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I literally went to Marvel when they were in bankruptcy and helped build, bring their content out of bankruptcy, right? So I've, I've felt like I'd seen it all and done it all, and yet this was the first time I'd been involved in a lawsuit. This gentleman has admitted to being in five lawsuits, up to five lawsuits at the same time. And you sit there and you think, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I go, right? So the question was, what surprised me? And the answer was twofold. Part of what surprises me about this is how cruel things are in this sphere, how much cruelty there is in the language, in the discussion. In, in, and I think it's something that we can all look at as we talk about whether or not we like something. And one of the intros that I made, and it will be an intro to the documentary proper, is think about your day, think about who you are and where you have been, and ask yourself, you know, what was the last thing that you posted on social media? And how many times this year have you said the word hate? Because we do it. We say hate, 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 hate. Constant barrage of hate. I said hatred. it on Sunday in a video on this very channel. We, we say it a lot, right? And so what we have to try to work out is whether or not we are contributing because hate is a very strong and big thing. And so we're, st we're all starting to kind of say many, many big things. Um, and then the second part of this that really surprised me was, was I've never been in a situation. I, I don't like calling someone a liar because I feel like it feels like hyperbole and it also plays right. into a tactic. If I call someone a liar, they call me a liar. And then at that point, everyone can say, well, I'm never going to know who's the liar. It's a 50 50 proposition. And that false equivalency is what these people rely on. And that's why I think the documentary will be so fascinating is that that technique to demonize me and to call me a liar would, would hopefully invite the response from me. Well, you're a liar. Well, I didn't say a word for a single year, and it did not stop Mr. Peters from continually defaming me on his streams. A constant barrage of Paul Jenkins said this, Paul is a liar. He lied, and that's why we fired him. And I sat there and I thought, you know, the people that know me, now you've called me lazy. Uh, you've said that I'm a liar. There must be a trifecta coming. And at some point, he decided to explain to everybody that I stole from his production. At which point my attorney uh, quite rightly wrote to them and said, as we go through our discovery process, you do realize that um, you're going to have to provide the proof of, of Mr. Jenkins stealing the stuff. Because at that point, if you don't, you probably dug your own hole, right? 
So it's been a fascinating ride to see falsehoods thrown at me and try to sit there in the middle of it and say, no, 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 that's a lie. I don't really feel like saying it, but to see so many falsehoods just constantly barraged, it's a technique, Rob, and it's one of the techniques that you see these people use. Oh, I, I, you know, I've been called a thief, a liar. I was told that I didn't. What's interesting to me when I'm told I didn't do the work, virtually everything that was finished that's come out of Axonar proper, not the other uh, subset of the Axonar fan films that was made outside of Alex's direct sphere, um, I finished it all. So, like, yeah. I think about, okay, not only did I prelude to Axanar, I produced all the material that's on the DVDs and the Blu-ray, I directed the Vulcan scene, I did countless podcasts, and while we had our office, I was at our office seven days a week. And while we were getting sued, I was making videos, you know, I was working on, the, with the Vulcan scene, I was working on the, so much stuff that I did. And mm. Alec and I were in that studio together every single day. Until I left on May 1st, 2017, we sort of parted ways. I didn't see much of Alec anymore because there was no reason to go to the studio. I was off doing other things. And I, like you, I didn't say a word. I kept my mouth shut. Alec moved to Atlanta, packed up everything. And, and the only thing he ever asked me for was a matte painting, Albert Whitlock's matte painting from the Menagerie that was his. You know, everything Everything was copacetic. Now, one of the things that never gets mentioned, because Alex says that I just took took money from him. I mean, he was paying me because I was working for him. It's like I didn't know him. Do you think he was just going to randomly give me cash? I mean, I was working on this project doing tens of thousands of dollars worth of work. Unbelievable amounts of work. And, mm -hmm. and I actually went to work full-time on Axanar in October of 20. 15 and the 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 deal was he was going to pay me three thousand dollars a month basically throughout the entirety of 2016 as we made axinar so it 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 was i got paid for october november december and i think we got sued on december 30th and i think he paid me for a couple more months but i i stopped work i stopped looking for work because i thought i was going to get paid and like he legitimately owed me um Forty, almost forty-five thousand dollars, of what that was. What I was promised to work on the project, I didn't get that. And and you know he's saying I owe him thirty thousand dollars. I owe him forty thousand dollars. I owe him fifty thousand dollars. I mean I was working for him, and then I had to find during this the lawsuit. I stuck by him while he was getting sued. Everything. Well, I mean I, I was a loyal. Here. I was a loyal. I I was more loyal to him. Everybody I knew said I was crazy for staying on yeah. this project, and no matter what, he's always talking about. Well, loyalty. You know how loyal I am. No, he is the most disloyal. The only people that he goes <laughs> off and sues are people that are loyal to him, and yeah. I'm just I'm shocked by it. He's come after me twice legally. As on your videos, he's threatening to do it again. He sued me yeah. in Georgia, hoping to get a. Uh, he didn't think I'd fight back because he could get a judgment against me. But that's uh, what he actually, does. I, I think I think that's not why. So let me let me tell you something. Uh, I wanted to stop you before because I think one of the things that I can see in watching you, I'm watching you on the other end of this because you've been on the receiving end, right? I'm on the yeah. receiving end of this thing. It's a it's a it's a legal attack, and I think when people go to the into the worm, it's actually into the wormhole documentary .com. When people go there, you can see the second blog. I did it was about vexatious litigation yeah and so it's no fun rob to be sued now what actually happened in your case was not exactly that you got sued in georgia with the hope of a judgment because there was no hope of a judgment there in fact alec peters tried to sue you in california and his own attorney turned him down and said you cannot do this you're going to violate slap laws you're not going to be able to sue this man in california well he also has no he can't back up what he's been saying you know, so also, but yeah, that's, he, he I'm, but again, it cost, I had to hire a lawyer. I still owe that lawyer $10,000. Yes. And it's awful. Right. And that's the, that, you know, definitely that's the last thing that I definitely want to talk about, which I think hopefully people will understand. Right. Listen. Uh-oh. Paul will come back. I, I'm telling you, people are trying to silence us. They're trying to silence I us, seem, Paul. I seem to remember this happened the last time that we talked. But anyway, I watch you um, looking stressed. Because understandably, you're stressed that you got sued in a, in a forum that wasn't correct. Uh, the person 
who could not sue you in California chose to sue you in Georgia. That's a very malicious and vexatious way to attack somebody. They know that that's the incorrect jurisdiction. In other words, you can't sue him uh, in California. Okay, I'll sue him in Georgia then. Well, you're not going to win in Georgia. There's nothing in Georgia. He's never been. You, I believe you've never been to Georgia, right? So no. there's no case there, but it did cost you 30 grand and it hurt you. And he bragged about it. You can see it on the vexatious thing oh, I know. lined up. He and, bragged and about how much it hurt. What, right? Not only that, I mean, I've got two girls and a, yeah. a, a woman I yeah. love here and a, we have a family and, you know, we make ends meet. We're barely surviving. Yeah. She's in school. There's girls that are in school here. The idea that somebody is utilizing the legal system to yeah. go after and specifically hurt people and yeah. then gleefully brag about it. See, if, but if I didn't defend myself in Georgia, he could have gotten a judgment against me. Uh, that's possible, right? But I think the point was uh, that the bragging is usually about how much harm and hurt he has caused, right? Yes. So now you multiply that by multiple lawsuits at the same time. You can watch that on the video. You put together yeah. a video where, in his own words, yeah. he talks about gleefully being five in, in five lawsuits with people yeah. where, I mean, and, and, and hurting people. Uh, that's yeah, what he wants to do. People. And I would say, you and I know this, why spend all of this time not creating? That, that speaks then to the mental health side of this, right? Which is, you know, you don't really particularly see me carrying myself with anger about this, but, but some sadness, right? Some real disappointment in this. Uh, understand that, you know, everyone out there should understand that there is a human cost to creators when we're, when we're under attack from these people, right? There's a cost. I am married. I have, I have two children. My wife suffered from trigeminal neuralgia. Go look it up and see that most neurologists will tell you it is the most pain a human being can deal with, right? My wife and I, she just had back surgery again. We have two young children. So at a certain point to be sued for literally helping someone, there was never a problem until we called them out. We basically said, you just can't behave like this on set and offset, at which point there was a lawsuit and then an offer for a separation agreement that basically took all of the work that I had done and made it belong to them. At which point we said, no, no, you don't get to just treat us badly, act this way, fire us and walk off with our stuff. That, that's not how it works. And at that point, we got a lawsuit. Now, that lawsuit was primarily and, and you know, it's been spoken about many times on, on his part uh, to get the copyright. It was very overtly stated. Paul Jenkins filed a false copyright, which is defamatory. <laughs> that you know, defamation is is a defamation. So it's a, it's it's defamation. It's not a federal. Not trying to win a federal lawsuit for a copyright, right? So understand, everybody out there, that the cost to me and my family to decide to stand up to this person was immense. And what we decided to do was to start making documentaries about this phenomenon. I have any number of friends who are creators who've been attacked repeatedly because they wrote something that somebody didn't like. They, they drew something that somebody, they said something. They, they're creating and they're not creating in a way that somebody wants them to create. And all of a sudden they're getting doxxed at their home. They're getting attacked. They're getting, Rob, if it doesn't stop, and if it doesn't stop with me, then it's not going to stop. And so while I ask people out there to understand, and I'm asking all of my creator friends, I'm asking everybody to, to spread the word about the documentary, that when I took this on, it was that moment where I stood there on the battlefield with a tin pot hat and a, and a cardboard shield and, and a wooden sword. And I looked around and said, all right, you know what? Who's with me? Because if we don't put a stop to this, it's never going to stop. And so I, you know, I felt that there was a, a mass of um, fear and anger and stress that had been thrown in the direction of creators, that this one particular individual was a perfect catalyst and a perfect case study of this phenomenon, the constant attacks, the bullying. And then once we got into the wormhole, that's why it was called into the wormhole, we found evidence of stuff that this had been going on for years and years and yes. years. It's not, it's not what happened when somebody raised 1.2 to potentially up to $2 million to make a fan film that never got delivered. What I would contend is who was it who walked in the door to get $1.2 million in their pocket? And when you see that, when you see what we found in the documentary and realize 
that these patterns of behavior, the stuff that has happened, has been going on for decades. At that point, we need to take a look at ourselves and mm. work out whether we can allow this anymore. And we need to take a look at these people. Well, you know, it's interesting to me. I think the great, uh, if, I, if I had to speak to a great shortcoming of mine, and I have a few, of course, is that I'm a believer. You know, I feel so privileged to be working on films and television because as a fan, and it's so much fun for me. Like, I knew that I was never going to work on official Star Trek in any capacity. I mean, I, I worked for CBS for three years making documentaries that I'm monumentally, prou monumentally proud of. We won two Saturn Awards for Star Trek and, and, and The Next Generation. Those those and I and I worked on Enterprise. It was wonderful. It was great. And for three years, we were the only new programming that Star Trek was the, the only new Star Trek programming, albeit documentaries, that was coming out from CBS. Great honor. But when I got to work on Axanar, to me, it was so much fun because this idea of making a canonical Star Trek movie in the universe that I love so much was a fun thing. This yeah. was like, woo, that's cool. Wow, this there's no downside to this, and it was fan supported. And I assumed, and this is where I always get into trouble, I just assumed that everybody's making it for the same reasons that I'm making it for. Like, I already know, as I'm sure that you do, when you work on something, it's going to be good. It'll be good to great. Sometimes it might be genius. But you already know in your heart of hearts that whatever you're going to be working on is going to be pretty good. Otherwise, yeah. why would you be doing it? You know, you yeah. already have yeah. that. And when we worked on Prelude... Uh, Christian brought in a lot of his production uh, people, like Jennifer Weberly, and all the people he brought in to actually physically produce this were great. Like everybody yeah. knew what they were doing. It went yeah. off without a hitch. All the actors, when I was I was on set and I was shooting the actors, uh, interviewing them when they were done shooting their parts, and every one of them said the same thing: this production is as smooth and by the numbers as any production I have and, ever and interesting. been on. Interesting enough, they said that about our production too. Ours was a very good production. It was really worked out well. It is now described as the, the uh, I believe he has coined a phrase, the disastrous October 2019 production is what he oh. now, comes, because it's just repeated phrase after repeated phrase. So th here's what I'd like to leave you with, Rob, because um, it is school day as well for my children. Yes, of and, course. Uh, remember, there's a, there's a human cost to this, right? And I have two children. Life goes on, man. I gotta take my children to their open house day. Like, this is the way, you know, we creators, we have families, right? But I wanted to leave you with this thought, if I may. And mm. it's, it's something for everybody out there to, to think about. When I first came in on this, I talked to somebody who had been watching this for years, and I wasn't really that, in, you know, I wasn't that aware of it. But I talked to somebody, and, and, and a concept came up that I really hadn't thought of before. And it was that now, when they think of, of Star Trek, which they have loved with every fiber of their being. They've loved Star Trek their entire life. And now a small piece of Star Trek is called Axanar, and it breaks their heart every time they think of Star Trek. In other words, it got destroyed by these people. And I think that is so sad and so avoidable. And that's the kind of thing that I want to fight against. I want, to, I want us to return the things that we love and the things that we want to do back to us back to the fans, back to the people that love it, back to the people that should have it and should help it be something. You can't get everything that you want, but it should the love should return and, and the hatred should really, really move away. So well, with that, uh, that's my that's my little uh, life Yeah, lesson. you got to go. I, I must take my little boy. Um, but thank you so much for having me on. I'd love to do this again soon. We can have a longer conversation. Yeah, Absolutely, Paul. Thanks for being here. Just quickly, where can people donate and find your documentary and your blog? I have it listed, the link, yeah. but you've got a website. People can yes. donate on the website. Yeah, it's into the into the wormhole documentary dot com. Into the wormhole documentary dot com. Go ahead and read the blogs. Um, see for yourself. Watch the, the YouTube mashups and you'll see who it is that we are trying to take a stand against because it's time for us all to take a stand. Well, Paul, thank you very much, Mr. Jenkins. It was great to see you always. Thanks, brother. Good to see you too. All right. Bye. I'll see you later. Well, it was great to have Paul Jenkins here for that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I've talked a lot about the Axonar project, but it was interesting to hear Paul's perspective. I mean, obviously the lawsuit uh, that's ongoing with Alec Peters. I've been through it twice with Alec Peters already, but it is an ongoing pattern. It's very funny to me because Alec is, um, he's literally gone after, he sued Jared, who ran his prop business, Dean, 
who built all of the Axonar sets with his bare hands over the course of a year. Paul, me, I don't think he's actually sued Christian, but all of the people that have made Axonar, the prime creative entities behind this thing that he loves and continues to raise money with, he's going after all of us, like all the people that made it. And as Paul pointed out, I resigned from the project after Alec uh, left. I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth shut, and it wasn't until I resigned in November of 2017 that things started to change. But, um, yeah, so it's it's really sort of unfortunate that um, uh, these kinds of things go on, especially we made th- we made something that was great. I, I love Prelude Daxnar, and I'll, I'll show you guys one more thing. There's one more thing I'll show you. So... When we were raising more money to get ready to do the feature, I had suggested after I turned over, after I had been made the director of the project, I said, I think that we, because Prelude to Axanar was is a documentary. So basically it was actors being shot against green screens, but they were all sitting in chairs for the most part. There's a few live action bits with Karn, the Klingon Karn that uh, um, Richard Hatch plays. And of course, Kate, Kate Vernon's character where she was on a set. But very little of that. And I said, look, you know, if people are going to buy into our vision and we're going to have to create alien worlds and alien environments, um, I said, listen, I would, if I'm going to direct something, I want to show you what we're doing, Let's or what I, what I hope to achieve in the movie. And I was working on the screenplay with Bill Hunt, and we really, he and I, I had, I had rewritten this Vulcan scene that was in the original script that Christian was doing, and I sort of changed it and made it more canonical to Star Trek. So Bill Hunt and I asked Bill Hunt from the Digital Bits to come and help me rewrite it. So I directed a um, proof of concept scene. We shot it in a parking lot one Saturday. And this was six years ago. It, it debuted at Comic-Con six years ago last week. And I shot it over a day. And um, we only had a 20 foot by 20 foot green screen. And I, I wanted to show you... Um, the Vulcan scene, as I conceived it and executed it, I directed it, I produced it, I edited the thing, I co, co, um, co-wrote it, and uh, the great Tobias Richter and his company, The Lightworks, did all of the visual effects. And there's, I have a documentary I'm going to drop uh, that's about an hour long on the making of this sequence. But since we're talking about it, and so you can appreciate the level that we were trying to bring to it, I'm going to show you both the original uh, uh, kind of a cut together, rough cut of what I'd shot live action and what it became. It's only it's six minute, six minutes of stuff. But you'll notice I was incorporating a lot of things in from Star Trek canon. Vulcan ships, um, Mount Salea that you first saw in a muck time. And later they, they correct Star Trek three, actually, then then it was retconned as being in a muck time. And then, of course, the animated series. So I'm just going to play this. Uh, this was the one scene from the Axonar feature film that I was directing that got made. Now, keep in mind, I'll tell you something. The actress that was going to play the Vulcan, uh, Talera, that was also, in my mind, a uh, I was bringing in Star Trek fiction, like Margaret Wander Bonanno's book, Strangers from the Sky. Talera was a character in that. When you watch this, so you'll know, Soval, Gary Graham from Enterprise, comes back and plays Soval, or was going to an Axnar. He's also left the project. Keep in mind that, to me, this, these, this was a married couple. This was a Vulcan married couple. And they were talking about, because of this war with the Klingons, that Vulcan was going to secede from the Federation. So here you're going to see my unmade cut and then what was finished. I sense your disapproval, Saval. Forgive me if I cause offense. There is no offense when none is taken, Shalera. We've known each other far too long for that. I fear the Council is making a grave mistake. 
The vote is cast. Ratification, but a mere formality. Vulcan will secede from the Federation. Minister, the Klingons began this war to shatter the Federation. Our exit will ensure that outcome. Will not our exit end the war, and thus bring peace with the Klingons? Peace is not their goal. If Vulcan secedes, other member worlds will follow. Divided, we will all fall to the Empire. But what good is a Federation that does not listen to us? We warned the humans that reckless expansion would provoke the Klingons. Why do you favor them, Saval? When our people were lost, it was the humans who led us back to the teachings of Serac. They have united us, world upon world, in common purpose. Your connection to them goes beyond logic. Perhaps. Humans are impulsive. They ride the tempest of their emotions but they grow stronger in doing so. No other race has accomplished so much in so short a time. We can learn from them. You must inform Earth that the Council's decision will soon be final. And you must help me change the Council's mind. We cannot abandon the Federation to Lyra. We must build a better future together. Chaos builds all the darkness. I sense your disapproval, Saval. Forgive me if I cause offense. There is no offense when none is taken to Lyra. We've known each other far too long for that. I fear the Council is making a grave mistake. The vote is cast. Ratification, but a mere formality. Vulcan will secede from the Federation. Minister, the Klingons began this war to shatter the Federation. Our exit will ensure that outcome. Will not our exit end the war, and thus bring peace with the Klingons? Peace is not their goal. If Vulcan secedes, other member worlds will follow. Divided, we will all fall to the Empire. But what good is a Federation that does not listen to us? We warned the humans that reckless expansion would provoke the Klingons. Why do you favor them, Saval? When our people were lost, it was the humans who led us back to the teachings of Serac. They have united us, world upon world, in common purpose. Your connection to them goes beyond logic. Perhaps. Humans are impulsive. They ride the tempest of their emotions. But they grow stronger doing so. No other race has accomplished so much in so short a time. We could learn from them. You must inform Earth that the Council's decision will soon be final. You must help me change the Council's mind. We cannot abandon the Federation to Lyra. We must build a better future together. For chaos builds only darkness. Well, that was actually the very last thing that ever came out of Axanar Productions, unfortunately, and that was six years ago. Of course, um, after this was released, we got sued, and that's a whole story that uh, Paul Jenkins will go over. And you know, I didn't want to make this all about Axanar today, 
But I was very proud of that scene because uh, perhaps in my life, uh, that's the only Star Trek scene I will have ever directed, at least unofficial Star Trek scene. I want to give a shout out to Alexander Bornstein, who scored that music. Uh, he and I went back and forth on that, and I work with Tobias Richter a great deal uh, directing all those sequences because each shot, of course, when you're making something that takes place in a virtual environment like that, every single shot uh, becomes an effect shot, obviously. And everybody that worked on the production that day it was uh, all hands on deck and also to the great cinematographer Milton Santiago, who shot all that. And he and I worked a long time to uh, to shoot that sequence, and that was all shot under natural sunlight. We had to chart across the day as the sun moved across the sky. We had to continually move our green screen around because the sun was coming over their shoulders, and we had to keep the sun in the same position every time we changed camera angles. So all of that was meticulously planned before we got there, and we finished early. So for those of you who want to do something, remember, the better off your project is, it's because the better off you planned it from the beginning. But anyway, um, that was a lot of fun to do, and uh, it's always fun to revisit Ah, what could have been, right? Am I right? Um, so anyway, uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch on today, in addition to Paul Jenkins, and as I said, if you're interested in what he has to say, he's got a blog, and you can go donate to his documentary, Into the Wormhole. He's going to be doing a series of documentaries, um, but if you'd like to be involved, there is a link down below to both his latest blog post and... Uh, the donation page. Um, so you can go check that out. Now, on a, ch a change of pace here, um, you know, there is a new newsletter uh, that's going around Hollywood by Matt Baloney. And, uh, or it's Baloney? It's B E L L O N I. So not Baloney has a first name. Uh, Maybe it's baloney. I, 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 baloney. I apologize if it if I'm getting it wrong, but it's a new newsletter along the lines of Richard Rushfield's The Ankler, called What I'm Hearing, and Matt was the editor of the Hollywood Reporter, and he is an entertainment lawyer, and he's now a partner in a new media company called Puck, which will uh, they'll they're going to be announcing it more formally this week. And um, if you want to get his newsletter, What I Am Hearing, uh, I'm going to put in the uh, link here in the live chat. And I suggest you get it because he is a very learned guy. And I really, uh, this newsletter is definitely worth getting. So I don't believe it costs any money, but um, I really have been enjoying his newsletter so check it out. But what I wanted to share, there's a great take. He's got a great take on the whole Scarlett Johansson suit with Disney. But what I was mostly interested in, in as we were coming out of the pandemic and obviously with the Delta variant, and I, of course, have a movie coming out theatrically at the beginning of September. So Tango Shalom, as you all know. Where movie theaters are at right now, we're talking about the, the windows used to be 90 to 120 days. Now they're down to 45 days. Uh, Black Widow is only spending 33 days in theaters before it goes away. These theatrical windows, how are studios and how are exhibitors going to work together to keep the ecosystem of movie theaters going? And what Matt did was he interviewed Tim League. And those of you might recognize his name, uh, the Alamo Draft House chain, and they have they are a forty one location draft house. The Alamo Draft House chain had forty one locations. They declared bankruptcy during COVID. They're coming out of that. They're a very innovative company that I believe. Don't quote me on this, but I believe started in Austin, Texas, and um, obviously they're now here in LA. Really, really great. Um. And one of the things that they've always been prized for is their innovation. They both love movies, but they also love the experience of being able to get good food and good drinks. And they really, it's a, it's, it's a cross between, I guess, 
having a, a great experience at home and then having a great experience in the theater. It's combined those, but the Alamo Draft House really makes theater going special. And um, Matt interviewed Tim League, and I wanted to share this interview with you guys to talk a little bit about it because I've been, to be honest, a little bit depressed about the theatrical experience and where movies are going. And I've talked a lot about is it an inevitability that the shared communal experience of movies is going away because it's always been my opinion that movie going is always best when any movie is better when you're in a theater, when you're seeing it 40 feet high on the biggest screen possible. Certainly a movie like Nomadland, it's an overwhelming experience if you see it in a theater. Now, yes, I own the Blu-ray, but to go to a theater and see Nomadland, a, a movie that literally is about wide open spaces that's part of the, the mise-en-scene of the whole thing, it it doesn't have the impact on a small screen. It really doesn't. And I think movies, I've always said when you go into a movie theater, it's like being in a, in a sensory deprivation tank. But in a way, it's it's not really a sensory deprivation tank because it's just the opposite. Your senses are completely opened up. Your hearing, your sight, and you're really, you're closed off to the rest of the world. And it allows you, the experience of a movie sweeps over you. And there's no better way to do that than to be in a movie theater. So here is uh, Matt Baloney's uh, interview with Tim League. Matt first starts out and says, you've got to be fearful of Delta and all of these new indoor mask requirements. Tim League says, my time of fear is over. If the last 18 months have proven anything, it's that we need to be on the balls of our feet and ready to pivot if we need to pivot. I do think that we're going to reach a point of stabilization. Matt says, a studio executive texted me the other day expressing alarm that this COVID surge is going to linger through the fall and winter, and it's going to sabotage the rebound of theaters. What's your take? Tim says, there's a lot of gloom and doom, obviously for good measure, but people want to go out of the home and be with people and have communal events, and movie theaters are generally on the safer side, so there's going to be a slower process to get to 2019 levels again, but we're going to get there. Matt says, do you still believe in a full rebound? I'm very, very confident that this idea that we offer an extraordinary experience in the cinema industry and people crave it, and it's magic, and it's special. It's not going to go away. Here, here. Matt says, Barry Dillard just said the theater industry will soon be 10 to 20% of what it is today. You can go back to an old observations I did a couple weeks ago where I talked about this very thing. Well, Barry Dillard's wrong. People go to live music. They go to the theater. And they go to the cinema to be completely immersed in stories. It just doesn't happen at home. There's probably going to be some level of shifts, but I still want to get out. I want to have great meals at fabulous restaurants, and I want to see beautiful movies. But your business is much more challenged. Do you resist some easy money makers like pre-show advertising? I look at it from 50,000 feet. Sure, it's revenue. It's also a horrible experience. Now it's more important than ever. Every aspect of the movie-going experience has to be dialed in. And I want everybody in the exhibition world to feel that pressure. So many people, especially in the analyst community, have been cheerleading the demise of theaters. I think it comes from the perception that the industry hasn't innovated enough. How do you respond to people who say these theaters deserve to die? Tim League says, those are hyperbolic comments. But it is an industry that hasn't felt the pressure. That 90-day window was a powerful thing, and theoretically, one could rest on their laurels. But I firmly believe that we're going to settle into an appropriate window that's flexible, depending on the type of movie. And cinemas have a strong relationship, a digital relationship with hardcore movie lovers, in terms of marketing and promotion with the studios for all platforms. Matt says, the studio business model used to be aligned with your business model, but Wall Street doesn't care about box office anymore, and it seems like theaters are almost an annoyance on the way to streaming. Tim League says, we're an annoyance? I'm not hearing that message when I talk to studio executives. What I see is people that are committed to the theatrical experience and know the power of it. Not just Black Widow. It's small movies as well. Speaking of annoyances, I get annoyed when people try and write off the independent film sector. We just had great box office with Roadrunner and Pig. It's still alive. With Parasite, we were heavily involved in developing a theatrical audience. It would have gone straight to a streaming platform. It would have come and gone. Speaking of Black Widow, do you think studios are using their day-and-date strategies in part to extract better revenue splits with theaters? 
Well, it's always a game. Every film is a negotiation, and the people that set those terms are master strategists and negotiators. So maybe that's true. I don't know. We're in a really interesting chapter of experimentation. First quarter of next year, we'll probably have a pretty standard set of business practices for theatrical windows. Well, won't those standards be markedly more difficult for you? I'm not so sure. For us, 85% of our revenue happens in those first couple of weeks. I want to turn movies faster. I think a shorter window will mean we get quicker into a split schedule where we can play the movie at times where it works and then be able to cycle it out. We're seeing much bigger drop-offs in second and third weekend box office for movies that are available at home. That's got to be a concern. Yeah, it is a concern, but it's too much of a multivariable equation right now to say it's absolutely this or it's absolutely that. I don't think we have a full audience out there. We're missing a lot of casual audiences who maybe haven't decided to return to cinemas yet. Things just need to stabilize before we make any grand assumptions about Black Widow or others. Well, what if the new normal becomes day and date product from the studio? I don't think that will happen because I don't think that's the best overall financial model. The way I'm reading the data is that the global cinema revenue is significant for studios. It's also the driver of brand building and property building and the hype of water cooler talk to maximize all the channels. You don't want to cut it off. Also, we've been playing day and date movies since we opened. Jason Killar, the CEO of Warner Media, justified his day and date strategy for 2021 by saying theaters essentially got a gift of a steady stream of product. Do you agree? Do I agree with that? I don't. I appreciate Warner Brothers having a steady supply of movies for cinema, but I also appreciate them going back to a traditional window next year. You mentioned you're looking at other properties. Have you looked at the Arclight Hollywood? Ooh, and this is some information I was glad to hear. It's my understanding that the owner, Decurian Corporation, is going to reopen and continue to operate the Arclight Hollywood. That's the word on the block, and it makes sense to me. Uh, very exciting. I want to th th say thanks to Matt and thanks to, as if I know Matt, uh, for this great new newsletter. And I, once again, I'm putting Matt Baloney's, um, I'm putting it in the live chat. So if you want to go there, subscribe. I think it's a great, uh, a great um, newsletter. And I'll say, look, I think Tim League is saying the same thing I've been saying on this show. I believe that a good theatrical run for movies, actually any theatrical run for movies, uh, well, it has to be, it has to be semi-decent, is good for the film. It adds value to the movie in the, down, the downstream markets, all downstream markets. If something came out theatrically, it's kind of anointed. That's why it's exciting to me that Tango Shalom will come out theatrically. And I think it's uh, really, really important that movies still do that. After all, do you think Marvel doesn't want to pull in $3 billion in the theaters for Avengers Endgame or an average of a billion dollars that they received for the first 23 movies of the, of the, um, of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe? Because I know they do. Um, there's been a lot of people, by the way, who have asked me about letters. I am very behind on your letter, letters. That doesn't mean I don't want you to not send them in. I do. I just, there's a lot of letters I need to get through. So if I haven't got to your letter yet, have no fear. I probably got, I don't know. Well, a lot. A lot of letters. Um, but yeah. So, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think I'll start with a few. And here's one. This comes from B Dub. B Dub writes in Mr. Burnett, this isn't going to be easy to digest. I'll get right down to it. I used to dig Friday Night Tights. Now, Friday Night Tights is Gary Beekler's Friday Night Tights that Az, who you've known on this channel, Az and I have streamed for quite some time. I used to dig Friday Night Tights, but that has changed. I know they are your friends, but I think we have something in common. I appreciate all the various Marvel series on Disney+, Plus, as I know you do. These series have their faults, but I can't say they've not entertained me. I believe that the Friday Night Tights crew have been spoiled and rate everything Marvel according to what has come before. Please give me your thoughts, and hopefully we can chat. 
in the future. Well, B-Dub, I want to thank you for writing in. You know, a lot of people, I, I get this a lot. You know, a lot of people uh, wonder sometimes why um, I, you know, I who seem to have a diametrically opposed viewpoint to people on, on Friday Night Tights, why I associate with those people. Well, first of all, let me just say right away, I like Gary Beekler. I like his work ethic. I like what he's done with his channel. I like him. And, you know, before I knew him, I streamed. I mean, I watched his streams. Jeremy, obviously, Jeremy Griggs from Geeks and Gamers. He invited me on his channel. And we had a delightful conversation. And Jeremy has done a great job building Geeks and Gamers. And he's got a good network of people that work with him. Of course, I adore Az. You know, Az and I have a lot of, a lot of fun together. But here's the thing. I don't have to agree with or 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 what they do in their in their time is is their time. And if you're going to watch their channels, watch their channels. I mean, I think the whole point is that we're all a little bit different. But at the same time, we are all fans. We're all fans. I am a little bit more, I would say, less discerning about certain things like B-Dub was pointing out. Um my default position is to like things. I know you're, you you go well, Rob. What about that uh, last video you did? I mean, it's so funny to me that that like I am I am vehemently opposed to what I feel they've done to Star Trek, and and I I rail about Star Trek as much as anybody else rails about anything else. So I think what's okay is when it comes to YouTube, we can all exist in this huge YouTube space. And I can be friends with people that I might not agree with all the time. But as I've said, everybody I know on YouTube has been very nice to me. Uh, it's funny. It's it's the people that should know. That it's the people that, that I, I've worked with longer and probably should know more that haven't. Um, people like Gary Beekler, people like Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers, and Az and everybody in the extended networks, the guys from Midnight's Edge, Andre and Tom, I mean, everybody that I've worked with and streamed with on uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Polly from Latino Slant. How, how can you not love him? The coach and Nick from Echo Base Network. I've had nothing but great experiences streaming with those people. What do you mean, those people? You know what I mean. We're all fans. And I think, you know, it's just like when I was a kid growing up going to conventions. I used to meet people that I would butt heads with all the time. We didn't always see eye to eye, but... We're all at the convention together. So, you know, that's the whole thing. Um, I I like people. Every person you meet has a story to tell, actually, that you have yet to hear. So I, I think one of the great privileges of being on YouTube is I've gotten to know so many people that I, I've had so much fun with, and I feel very privileged to know everyone. Now, you know, if you don't like something that's going on on someone's channel tell them i certainly maybe it's because i leave my dms open if somebody doesn't like what i'm doing yo man i hear all about it now i do have a, and i really appreciate when everybody comes and talks to me um but i think if you don't like something a youtuber that you watch is doing reach out and talk to them you know don't go fuck you dude but, but, you know, like, like B-Dub's letter, very respectful, very nice. I mean, it's all about how you approach. Look, when you're going to, I'll tell you something. As you all know, once you've made something like a movie, if you're a creator, you've got to let your work lead. I learned early on that when you make something, you put it out for public consumption. Don't defend it. Certainly don't defend it on social media. The work that you've done should be your only defense. And if people dislike it, try and discover why. During the stream that uh, with when Paul Jenkins was on, uh, Midnight's Edge sent in a super chat, and I'd like to read it. Star Trek, Doctor Who, and all the others weren't torn apart by toxic fans, but by toxic creators who twisted and subverted once inclusive properties that they inherited into something exclusionary they never were before. Now, I really kind of totally agree with that. 
And I, I think it's, it's very odd, and I've talked about this a lot on the show before, that the script has been sort of flipped. I mean, before, if you think about Doctor Who and you think about Star Trek and you think about Star Wars, really these are the creations of either one guy or one creator. And they made these things. Sure, 20th Century Fox had to give George Lucas the money to make Star Wars, but they're giving it to one guy. And this one guy had a dream of, of making Star Wars what it was. Gene Roddenberry wanted to make his wagon train to the stars. He had his sort of, he had his Kennedy-esque Camelot White House vision of the future that he was bringing to it. And he was able to do that. Um, and remember when Star Trek was originally on, it was never a ratings hit. I mean, they had to have a fan campaign, a letter writing campaign to even get a third season of the original series. It wasn't until Star Trek went into strip syndication in 1972, also when they had the very first Star Trek convention, but people started looking at Star Trek and discovering, mostly college-age kids, people that were inspired by Star Trek. Now, the funny thing about those college-age kids is they were inspired by what was already there, all of the inclusion that they saw. Could it have done better? Sure, but at the time... The time it was bucking every trend, the fact they got away with as much as they got away with was insane. It was insane. But now, as Midnight's Edge pointed out, the script has been flipped. You know, you hear these creators talk about how they're using, I mean, um, Damon Lindelof, in an interview he was doing with Watchmen, said when TV writers get together, they outwoke each other. That isn't storytelling anymore. That's, uh, I always have said, Never put your agenda before your um, uh, before your characters and your story. That way lies death, and that's what's happened. You know, no longer the as as corporations have bought up these ideas, these IPs. It's no longer about the storytelling or what the essence of this thing was. The it's about exploiting the IP across many different platforms. I mean, you know, people have asked me, well, Rob, if if you're so dissatisfied with what Alex Kurtzman has been doing. Why do you think that they've made him, uh, given him control of all of these things? Well, I mean, look, Star Trek is their biggest brand. It really doesn't matter in their eyes if Star Trek, they just need a lot of Star Trek. So people walk through the door, you know, are they going to, are they going to, are, are they going to come? Ooh, there's new Star Trek all come over. It's, it's like a Pavlovian response. It certainly is for me. I know there's new Star Trek. It's like, oh, <laughs> You know, the unfortunate thing is the Star Trek that's being made is by people that are interested in changing what it is and turning it into what they want it to be, which is odd to me. It's odd that they allow creators who want to change the very thing that they're building their their streaming service around. Let's change it into something else, because ultimately, I'll tell you something. Like the original Star Trek, it was not discovered right away. It was discovered later. And the question that I would ask is, in five years, is Star Trek Discovery going to be discovered by a whole new group of college students? And is it going to be looked at the way the original series was looked at in 1972? I mean, the original series debuted in 66, it went off the air in 69, but it really didn't achieve its... I mean, the 70s were Star Trek crazy. I mean, you started out with the series going into syndication, uh, it was huge success, a year later, 73, 74, there were 22 episodes of the animated series, and Star Trek continued to be a success. A publishing empire was born. The Star Trek log series, the Mego action figures, the Franz Joseph technical manual and blueprints. People loved Star Trek in the 70s. It got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then in 1979, that all culminated with what was at the time one of the most expensive movies ever made. By the way, can I just fucking rail on Paramount? Who the fuck color-timed your Star Trek The Motion Picture? My God, when... Can I just go on a rant? Who color-timed Star Trek The Motion Picture in 4K? Who, who does this? Why do the studios, now that they've decimated their home video divisions, if you're going to go back and you're going to color-time a movie that came out 42 years ago, please get somebody that knows what they're doing. Please, don't turn... The Vulcan scene at the beginning of Star Trek, the motion picture, all red. Make it more red. Oh, we got to make it look more like Vulcan. No, you have to make it look like how it was intended when it was shot. My God. Uh, you can now, by the way, you can now get Star Trek, the motion picture in 4K. There's a new 4K transfer, which is what the 
the team that's doing the director's edition has to work off of, please let them go back into the negative and retime the fucking movie because I don't know who oversaw your Star Trek The Motion Picture 4K version, but fuck them. Seriously, fuck them. As a post-production supervisor myself, who is making... Those are creative choices that somebody made. Why are you allowing people like that... Why are you allowing your cinematic legacy to be fucked with that way? I mean, in all... Come on, really? You know, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to see this kind of... It's vandalism. It's cultural vandalism. And maybe when they go back and they do the director's edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture, I have no knowledge of whether or not they're going to be allowed to do this. But by God, people, please allow that team to color time the movie better. Because you fucked up. You done fucked up. And it's it's abhorrent. It's abhorrent how Star Trek has been treated. Uh, and apparently nobody fucking cares. But that's that's neither here nor there. Where am I? Anyway... Really, it's, it's awful. And you know what? Don't take my word for it. Go watch it yourself. It's apparently available on, on iTunes now. Mikey Leto. Mikey Leto, who I owe a, to live and die in L.A. Blu-ray to. Mikey Leto is here. Mikey Leto says, Subject, The Observations Midnighter. There's a scene about 40 minutes into episode 5 of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier that kind of goes like this. Bucky is speaking and says, When Steve told me what he was planning, I didn't think either of us really understood what it felt like for a black man to be handed the shield. How could we? Good evening, Rob, and hello to my fellow members of the Post Geek Singularity, and especially the Blue Wrenches. I come here not to bury Rob Burnett, but to praise him. I don't often speak up or write letters except when I have something to say. I'm going to miss the Rob Observations Midnighter. Ooh, stay tuned about that. That was my jam. I don't consider myself a metal person. Mike Lita, you are fucking metal. You are. I don't consider myself a metal person, so Midnight Metal isn't really my thing. I've caught bits and pieces of other Burnettwork shows despite thinking I didn't have anything to relate by watching, and I've been surprised at how many times those bits and pieces can bring me some joy in a frequently joyless world. Midnighter was just the show closest to my being because it epitomizes what I most want out of not just entertainment, but life. That is, the realization that citizens of the United States are also citizens of the planet. And it's long time past that we come to the realization and stop acting like we're the most important people on this globe we call the Earth. Rob's delight in talking with people from around the world is infectious. To me, if not the rest of the imagination connoisseurs, watching The Midnighter answered many questions for me about how popular culture, especially that is sourced in this country, is viewed around the globe. I especially liked how sometimes real life snuck into the conversation and Rob's genuine interest in the people he invited to join his program. A week or so ago, I noticed that Rob left his private messages open. I contacted him to seek permission to place an edited version of the first two conversations I had with him on The Midnighter on a YouTube channel I'm thinking of starting. I did it in private, as I believe it's bad form to ask someone in public for something and essentially embarrass them into saying yes. We've seen that in countless public events where some guy asks a woman to marry him, and of course, she's expected to say yes. Well, I wanted him to have the opportunity to say no, Mikey. Mikey, you know what the answer on this channel is? It's always yes, for the most part. And not feel cornered, but I really appreciate what you're saying. Not only did he not say no, he was enthusiastic in his response. Heck yeah, please do. I internally giggle when Rob takes joyful glee in attracting an audience from around the world. Rob, this is your opportunity to insert your international audience analytics as an aside. I could do that because that makes me happy. We're far too insulated as a country, if I might break in here. I love hearing from people around the world. I mean, you got Alex in Colombia. You know, you've got, uh, you've got our friend over in uh, Portugal. And uh, there's just so many people. that Stubble McShave in Sweden. I, there's just so many people uh, that are all around the world. Um, Martino Simoni over on the, I guess, the Italian Swiss border i mean there's so many people that i've met on this show that i love my friend terry from norway but also andre from norway uh it's great i I love having people from around the world come on the show it's uh swack props you know 
Um, it's it's the, the cinemike. Uh, it's great. Anyway, the only time Rob makes me cringe is when he starts to talk about how we are becoming better as a country. He's not wrong. I understand what he's trying to say, but I feel like it's my job as one of his internet friends to remind him that we should talk about the reality of what is happening around us. I tagged Rob on an article today to point out, oh, it was bad. That was a bad article. And it depressed him, for which I apologize. I just wanted him to realize, as Bucky acknowledged to Sam in the opening of the letter, that none of us really understands what it's like to walk in another man's shoes. And like Rob says at the end of every broadcast, all you have to do is listen. So farewell to the Midnighter. I absolutely believe Rob intends to bring it back when his schedule lightens up, although frankly, I don't know if that would indicate good things for Rob. If Jeremiah takes over the Midnighter, which we're in talks for Jeremiah to do just that, not because he's a black man, but because he has so much more knowledge about popular culture than I do, isn't it odd I feel the need to explain that? I know, right? Um, however, I'd probably give it a shot at least once. I want to relate a brief summary, summary for my appearance on Midnighter when I came on to defend the release of In the Heights. As someone who has been involved in online communities since 1992, after my appearance, I went back and scanned the chat and reviewed the comments to see if there was anything I needed to address. One community member suggested that I was out for revenge, <laughs> a comment that puzzled me. Who am I expected to take revenge against? Should I travel to Pasadena and invite Rob out for dinner and drinks and then murder him in an alleyway a la Griffin Mill and Robert Altman's The Player? I can write. What can you do? I love that movie. I love the book, too. Do you know they wrote a sequel? Michael Tolkien wrote a sequel, The Return of the Player. I have no idea what the dude was talking about. Another community member in the comments suggested I was invalidating their concerns and valid gripes with insanity, apparently quoting me. I responded to this comment. I said it wasn't my intention to invalidate anyone else's opinion, but rather to point out it's insane to boycott a film and then expect Hollywood's power brokers to produce another movie when the first film didn't make money because of the boycott. I asked the correspondent to respond to my much lengthier comment, but there was no response. I'm trying to say here that we're never going to get out of the mess we're currently in if we're not willing to listen and speak to each other. Notice I didn't say hear and talk, but listen and speak. And yes, Rob, I consider you an internet friend. And Mike Alito, I consider you a friend as well. A friend is a person you invite into your home, and they feel comfortable inviting you into theirs. You do this nightly, sometimes several times a day. I've done it twice. Should I ever make the trip back to the West Coast, I'll invite you out for drinks and dinner and we'll avoid the trip to the alley. Ciao for now, your friend, the Imagination Contrarian. I love that, the Imagination Contrarian, Mikey Leto. Um, what a great letter. Uh, but I would expect, to be honest, nothing less of you, sir. Uh, to know you is to love you. So, uh, indeed, I, um, I will thank you for that. Uh, what a great letter. Uh-oh, you know what I just did? I just accidentally clicked off. I clicked off everyone's letters. I didn't mean to. Um, hang on a minute and let me get everything back. It's like when Brock Peters is trying to get back Kirk in Star Trek IV. Get him back. Get him back. Um, people are like, wait, what? I know. It's random Star Trek stream of consciousness. <clears throat> but it is true. Uh, hang on one second. Let me just, do you ever have that? You know, I half my, half the time when I'm not uh, streaming, my mind is just full of conversations from Star Trek from, and they just are random from everywhere. It's not like from one place or another. It's kind of embarrassing, really. I'm kind of glad you're not all in my, in my brain to know what's going on because uh, that might be a little weird, but I think everybody would be like, oh, you really are this way all the time. I'm like, yes, yes, I am. Uh, let me see if I can get the letters back. Let me get them back. Oh, I'm ha did I freeze up? I hope I didn't freeze up. Please, please, people. Uh, give me a moment. Like, how? Just a moment. Just a moment. I've just detected a fault in the AE-35 unit. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let me get back to where I was going. And, uh... I'm having a, apparently some kind of a streaming difficulty at this point. But that's okay. Uh, let's see. 
-mm. Here's a letter from Paul. Uh, Paul Goulart in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hello, Robert Byer Burnett. As a forewarning, this curious message does get somewhat political. Uh-oh, uh-oh. However, I do feel this topic is in fact something that is affecting our movie-going experience. I still don't know if my film will debut in Los Angeles during the upcoming Dome Film Festival, as they've not responded to my request yet and are already stating that this pandemic may have altered their ability to present in the theaters to a large crowd. I know it has been a while since we last talked. I apologize for that as I've been dealing with the loss, with loss in this pandemic. I was just watching you speak with John Campia recently on the topic of how the unvaccinated may be at fault for having delays in our movie viewing. Personally, I'm fully vaccinated as well, as is my wife. I've read many articles that the CDC and doctors have placed over the last year in regards to this pandemic. For example, last summer it was stated we would lose an additional 75,000 people by the end of the year if not every American wears a mask. During the end of the year, I saw how number uh, I saw the number rose to the high-end projections of deaths in the country, which says to me that the CDC has warned us not all Americans wore masks. Now the CDC is stating that we need to hit a 70 to 80 percent of all Americans to be vaccinated in order to not allow this virus to mutate into something more powerful than what we see now as a fourth variant, the Delta variant. I fear that once again, we will lose even more people to this virus, and soon we will all know someone in the family and our circle of friends that has suffered. I recently went to a comic book shop here in Fort Collins, Colorado, and a sign outside their door states, let us turn this pandemic into a once in a lifetime experience. Wear your mask if you're not vaccinated, and only fully vaccinated people can come in without masks. This should be a message in front of every door in America. Seriously, how can the general public learn that we actually need these horrific statistics to go way down in order for us to go about our normal lives? I want to enjoy movies in a theater once again, and I cannot feel comfortable to do so after seeing close friends and family suffer from this pandemic alone. Already in the past week, I have seen the tones of people's speeches change after they have finally lost close family to the illness. A few months ago, a woman stated she does not think this virus is real and will not be vaccinated with her child. Now she preaches that all children should be vaccinated before attending school. I know this is very extreme, but enough to change a perception of this mother of a wonderful boy to change her mind about vaccinations. I, I, I hope that doesn't mean he passed away. I hate to say this, but I think that to get the other half of the nation to be on board with the CDC is to actually see more deaths appear at a rapid rate and people's loved ones be affected by COVID. I want to be comfortable to attend movies and fully enjoy them once again with my family. I want to be able to present my film to a large audience. If all Americans want to get back to the ways in which we used to live our lives, we shall start listening to the national warnings provided by the CDC. Other than what was stated, why is this so hard for us to achieve? Your friend from Fort Collins, Colorado, Paul Goulart. For those of you, uh, I was invited. I was the guest of honor at a convention in Fort Collins, Colorado, where I saw a locally produced Doctor Who fan film that I thought was pretty damn good. And it was one of the better run fan conventions I've ever been to. And better yet, I it was a family convention. I met a lot of great people. And uh, it was me and, and Gigi Edgeley and the great Richard Hatch. And I think it was one of the last conventions Richard Hatch attended. He was having, um, he was having, um, uh, he, he didn't know how sick he was, but he was not having a good time. Uh, Angelo Ortiz sends in a super chat sticker. I want to thank you for that. I don't, I gotta, I gotta learn all the meanings of these super chat stickers um, because I don't know what they all mean. And I know I need to, but thank you for that. So, look, my feeling about it is that I don't understand. Sort of the as somebody who's always embraced science and always been interested in science, I and one of my favorite things in the world is I love stories about plagues. I don't know what that says about me, but uh, I always have. So I've read every 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 horror novel or anything that's to do with some global pandemic. I read it, man, all the way back to the two the two books that did it for me were, were Graham Masterton's Plague, and then of course the Granddaddy of all. Well, I guess you said it's like Earth Abides, but Stephen King's The Stand. And, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't quite understand it. Um, 
I've known a few people that have passed away because of COVID. It's something that shouldn't happen, but unfortunately it did. And that's, um, that's a bummer. But I want to thank you for that letter. Brian Foster writes in. He writes in, Rob, you do know that the CBS Kurtzman, etc. stole the tardigrade and other concepts on Star Trek Discovery from a poor video game designer named Anis Abdin, right? Uh, not only did they copy the tardigrade concept from the man's video game, they copied the look of a lot of characters in his video game. And of course, the rich bastards got away with it despite being taken to court. The problem with Kurtzman's star wreck is that you have these idiots running powerful companies who have now decided that everything in entertainment must come with a socio-political, social justice warrior message. Social justice is good, but modern-day social justice warriors are crazy. These company owners have the audacity to think that they should bypass the most important things, quality, fun, escapism, and simply go for the message and that we should eat it up and call it the best thing ever. I, how's that? From, was that a good doomcock? I'm sorry that I can't find the exact quote, but Kurtzman even made a comment that he saw Star Trek as a soapbox for social issues and the message more than a sci-fi show. And of course, the sheep of Twitter will attack with, Star Trek was always about social justice. Well, it was, and it was done in a natural and palatable way. It wasn't the sole focus of classic Star Trek, nor was it the sole reason for being. There was much more to it than that, and it was good, relatable sci-fi before being anything else. Star Trek of today puts the social justice warrior message before everything, and that is the only thing that matters to the creators. There's no respect for the legacy of the property. There's no respect for the fans that devoted their hearts and countless dollars to the franchise over the years. The new Star Trek shows are nothing more than slick commercials to show every race, gender, sexual orientation, and yes, even body size. And of course, to insult and demean male characters like Picard. Michael Burnham gets to continually break Starfleet protocol, uh, and is propped up to be some sort of superior hero simply because she is female and black. The writers don't even have the skill to make her seem not obnoxious. What's wrong with that, you may ask? Nothing, except that's not what makes a show good. A good show makes a show good. Honoring the legacy makes a show good. Waving a flag and saying, look how diverse we are, doesn't make a show good. Until creators go back to caring about quality, fun, escapism, all entertainment will continue to suffer. Those things matter more than other considerations. As a black man myself, I don't need a strong black character in a movie for me to be able to enjoy it. I just want a good movie, damn it. P.S. Just one additional comment. I don't believe in cancel culture or censorship, but when you were talking about the man who fell to earth being miscredited, it was very painful to hear all of those Jesus fucking Christ outbursts you made. I'm sure you have a lot of Christian fans, myself being one, and that was horribly ugly to listen to. I decided the best thing for me to do at that point was to turn the show off. I'm not going to act a fool about it and post evil things about you like the Twitter cancel culture idiots do. I'm just letting you know how I feel with the common sense message. And I will probably continue to watch with caution and trepidation. Thank you for your time, Brian. Well, Brian, uh, see, again, I, I would say this is the kind of communication that I... Um, welcome. And when it comes to, you're right. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. There was a letter early on that I always think about, about profanity that someone wrote when I first started this show. And uh, you're, you're right. I shouldn't have used that language. I need to be mindful. I do not have a problem being mindful of people not wanting to take the Lord's name in vain. Just the same way that if somebody wants me to call them by their preferred pronouns, I have no, I have no problem doing that either. I think it's important to be mindful of your audience, and I think it's important to respect people's wishes. Like, like I, I, I have no problem if you bring up the fact that please do not take the Lord's name in vain. I should be more mindful of that. I agree with you. I probably should be more mindful of that because I do have a lot of Christian fans. I know because they've contacted me. It's just the same way that if somebody asked me to address them by their preferred pr pronouns, I would have no problem doing that either. The, the problem that I have is, is when these things become law and you have compelled speech. But on a show like this, with a, a, a very diverse, uh, wide-ranging group of people, I think it's only right that you are more mindful of those things. And, you know, I swear too much on this show as it is. And like you, I mean, like you said, as a black man, 
you know, I was just reading an article the other day. I forget where it was. I don't know if it was, but it was, again, it was an article that was recently published about the, the portrayal of black fatherhood on Deep Space Nine. I mean, my whole thing is this. It makes no sense to me that you're talking about diversity on the Enterprise or on the Discovery a thousand years in the future. Because human beings would be, we would have sorted these problems out a long time ago. And why Star Trek, modern Star Trek, isn't addressing, I mean, my God, I want to see some transhuman people. I want to see people that change their gender at will. I want to see people that are, like, when I watch somebody talk about how they're non-binary in the 32nd century, I'm like, really, writers? Non we have non-binary people now. Where do you think non-binary people are going to be in the 32nd century when they have all of that great medical technology available to them? I mean, if you were really audacious, you know, you could do things like people would change their gender at will if they wanted to be. Or you could have somebody whose sexual kink, a guy, liked to be turned into a girl and make love to his partner uh, with different genitalia and with surgical technology being the way it was he could go swap that out at will if he wanted i mean i would like to see if you're going to go for progressiveness go for real science fiction progressiveness don't just by transposing our see what we're, what star trek was supposed to do was it was the alien races that we meet the people that we're dealing with out there that's where you 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 put in all of your your agenda-driven storytelling. And our characters were these evolved human beings, but now they flipped the script on us. Now the, the aliens and everything out there are stupid AI. There's, there's no sense of what... There's no sense of adventure or alien race. I mean, the alien races have been so dumbed down, and now we're... No, look at... We're making a show about diversity. When you're talking about diversity in the 32nd century, and you're actually having a non-binary character tell a gay character to correct a gay character... This is not diversity. This is just terrible science fiction. It's bad. Because those concerns would be long forgotten. I would, I would love to... I, you know, here's my thing about great... You know how... Let me tell you the difference between great science fiction and Star Trek Discovery. With great science fiction, you have to sit down and go, Okay, let's look at our own history. Our own human history. And let's, I don't know, jumping off point of... of, of how we lead our lives. Where was humanity in, in 11, uh, 11, 21, right? Or, or, or what would, would be 10, 21, I guess, right? Yeah. 10, 21. So we're, where would we be in 10, 21 and where would be, we be now? What happened in the last thousand years to human history? Um, wh what happened to our society? What about human beings personally? How are human beings different personally a thousand years later? Well, our life expectancy has expanded. Um, that would be one thing. We've eradicated certain diseases based on our medical technology. Okay, that's another thing. And as the thousand years, it took a long time to get there. But where would we be a thousand years from now with the technology that currently exists? How can we extrapolate using our medical technology and our computer technology, biotechnology, where would we be as human beings? I mean, theoretically, we certainly should be barely recognizable as humans in the 32nd century as we are now. But that's neither here nor there. But that's what science fiction is about. It's about extrapolating where we go from here to where we're going to wind up. And all great science fiction is about that, whether it's about our technology or about our, our physical beings or about our morals and ethics. But if you're going out into space... And you require that kind of technology and we're spacefaring, it means we're on a pretty good path and our technology has increased exponentially from where it is now. So uh, if you want to tell a story about, like you want to introduce a character that's non-binary that's going to be part of the crew, why do they have to be non-binary like they are in, oh, I don't know, the 20th century or the 21st century? What does that look like in the future with all of that medical technology and everything that they could do? I mean, I think it'd be much, if you're going to embrace that idea, go far. Go far where, where someone's non-binary identity, they can literally change themselves at will. Like, why not make somebody that takes as much pleasure in, in men and women, but it's not just they're not just bisexual. They literally change their sex whenever they want. Take that. Go that. Make that. That's a good science fiction concept. And so when I watch that, I, I, I just I feel like the modern, modern Star Trek is just, <laughs> there's no imagination in it. Zero.
And unfortunately, I agree with you. You know, the, the problem is when Sonequa Martin-Green is given a black boyfriend, what they're doing is it's not a diverse show. It's a segregationist show. The gay characters are friends with each other. Oh, here, the non-binary person can talk to the two gay, the gay couple, whereas the beautiful black woman has a black boyfriend. It's very weird and segregationist. This is the, this is the exact opposite of what Star Trek is. I mean, the one thing about the, the Kelvin timeline is at least you could say Spock inexplicably is in a relationship with Uhura because they wanted to bring in Zoe Saldana and, and change the dynamic. Um, and that's okay. I mean, we've seen a Vulcan with a human woman again, and I guess that's what is analogous. But even that, it's like, oh, you mean, why can't Spock date an Andorian? The only reason Spock hooks up, I mean, obviously the Zoe Saldana is one of the stars of the movie, but... Wouldn't it have been more interesting if, if Spock has an alien girlfriend that's not... Uh, uh, he didn't just look to his dad and's like, oh, I'm going to start banging an Earth girl. Wouldn't it have been much more interesting if Spock had a relationship that you wouldn't expect? I mean, it would be more interesting to me if, if you made the character of... If you made Spock a gay character and the reason he was attracted to his partner is because his partner might have been a great artist or he was an incredible mathematician. And Spock was in love with his mind, literally how his mind worked, because he had melded with him. There you go. That's the kind of progress I would like to see. I'd be all for that, you know, only because that would be more interesting and more science fiction-y, you know, that, that Spock really truly fell in love with another individual. I mean, Spock is beyond gender unless he's interested in procreating, but he might have met the love of his life who's, who's basically the physical equivalent of what V'ger could have been. That would be interesting to me. I would be up for watching that. I know people are going, would you, what, what? Because it would be interesting and it would be more science fiction-y that Sp Spock fell in love with somebody inadvertently that he had to meld with for some reason and saw like this one of the great minds from whatever planet and Spock melded with him and truly saw who this person was and fell in love with that. It would have been an overwhelming thing. Vulcans have emotion. They just control their emotion. That's the difference. People are like, oh, Vulcans don't have emotions. Yes, they do. I mean, they, they cast out their animal passions on these sands. At the beginning of Star Trek, the motion picture, we hear the Vulcan masters say that. So what I really want, if you want to get really progressive, get progressive. I mean, the, 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 the progressiveness is stunted. It's only the progressiveness that we have to recognize ourselves today. No, push it further. Go really far. If you want to get really progressive, what does a human civilization that has embraced all of these things look like a thousand years after it's embraced all these things? But the thing is, they're not, they're, they, just, they can't imagine anything more. I, I mean, take, take today's progressiveness, if that's what you want to do, and extrapolate it a thousand years hence. I want to see that Star Trek show. So anyway, I want to thank you for writing in, Brian. Good letter. Good letter. Cookie Madison writes in. Cookie Madison says, Hello, Rob and fellow Imagination Connoisseurs. I really enjoyed your heartfelt and well-deserved rant towards Alex Kurtzman today, and I hope it helped. <laughs> it did. Uh, having watched my Rob observations now, I know how deeply Mr. Roddenberry's vision of the future touched your soul. While my love doesn't run quite as deeply, Star Trek is something meaningful to me, and like you, I find the current interpretations unwatchable. The original series inspired my lifelong love of great science fiction. These new shows inspire only a sense of loss. As you vented your spleen and rightly wondered how Alex Kurtzman can still be employed, it put me in the mind of the play Glen Gary, Glen Ross. David Mamet is one of my personal heroes, as he should be, and his play about the destructive and corrupting nature of business seems particularly apt now as giant corporations increasingly push their consumer-driven ideology into every aspect of our lives, not the least of which into the entertainment we love. In the play, the character Williamson, played by Kevin Spacey in the film, is a slimy little toady who uses his proximity to the owners to sabotage his colleagues in order to secure his own position in the company. He does this because he secretly knows he doesn't have the talent to compete with them. When one of them, Ricky Roma, finally realizes the game Williamson is playing, he says, Who told you that you could work with men? I'm going to have your job, you shithead. I don't care whose nephew you are. I don't care whose dick you're sucking. You're out. 
How nice would it be for someone, perhaps yourself, to say that to Alex Kurtzman? There are people like this in every industry, but the business of shows seems to produce them with alarming regularity, and I think even more so now as the accountants have totally taken over. I'm not naive, and I know it's always been a business, but there was a golden time when studio heads recognized the wisdom of leaving the creative people alone to get on with doing what they were good at. They were also educated. The studio bosses knew what made a good story. I think of that amazing period between 68 and 77 when we got some of the best American cinema produced ever produced. People like Coppola, Scorsese, Lumet, Nichols were handed the keys and allowed to drive that car without daddy looking over their shoulder. The result was that we got great movies and everyone made money. In one of the articles you read was a comment that these current Trek shows are about increasing consumer products. And so there it is, both literally and figuratively. The bottom line is the only thing that matters, finally. Well, Rob, this has been an overly long letter. Like you, I don't see a therapist, so this is my catharsis. I feel better now. All the best, Cookie. Well, Cookie, thank you. No, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Look, I don't begrudge, I don't know Alex Kurtzman, but here's what I do know. Alex Kurtzman swooped in and got himself a co-creator credit on Star Trek Discovery, which he did not co-create. He also then, he then went and created a Clarice show. Now, call me crazy, but your co-creator of Star Trek Discovery, Brian Fuller, did more with Thomas Harris's material in three seasons with his show Hannibal uh, than you could ever have done. If you wrote a thousand scripts over a thousand years or whatever, a thousand days, you would never have come close to one of Brian Fuller's scripts for Hannibal. And I ask you, sir, as a good producer, why, if you're doing a Clarice show, knowing full well that Brian Fuller could not get the rights to the one book you had the rights to, well, you had the rights to the Clarice Starling character, isn't it amazing that you made a Clarice show where you couldn't use Hannibal Lecter? And the one man that did use Hannibal Lecter so brilliantly, who you co-created a show with, you didn't go to him and say, bruh, you made one of the finest horror television shows of all time. Why don't you come over here and co-create with Jenny Lamette and I, Clarice? How, how does anybody in their right mind forget Star Trek? How do you go and do that? I read that Clarice pilot. It was god awful. I mean, it was Clarice giving you, telling a therapist, uh, flashing back for, for 15 pages. And I'm like, that alone, my friend. You know, you, you, what? How do you not do that? I don't know. But that's bad producing. And look what you wound up doing. Look where Clarice is now. Anyway, at least Hannibal ran three seasons, and it stands as one of the great horror science fiction of all time. Umberto Hernandez writes in, Hey, mate, so this is something I often ponder. When you look at modern Star Wars, we don't have to wonder what Mr. Lucas thinks of it. He's still with us, and he can let us know. With modern Star Trek, though, if I could present any thoughts to those making it, it would be for them to consider what Mr. Roddenberry would think if he saw what his creation has become. Would he approve? Of course, they would probably say yes, either out of sincerity that they really believe that, or because they have to say so since they have their responses monitored, even if they know it's not true. Whatever the case, I would raise to you the same question, and please don't just say yes or no, not that I think you would, Really think about it as I have because the saying is so easy, but to help us articulate our grievances that we have to actually use our words and imaginations. Our first instinct is to always have an explosive reaction, which is fine, more than fine, it's natural and our right, but that's for ourselves and not for the purposes of debate or persuasion. I'm sorry if this feels like I'm preaching to the choir, but when I thought about it, would the opposite occur to me? What if someone told me that Mr. Roddenberry, in fact, would approve of how his franchise was being handled? My first instinct would be to not deny it, but of course the question arises. Oh, why? What have you seen to make you so certain of this? Well, it's in the way people acted in the shows when he was alive. It's in the things that they say and do and how they act and react. 
People in modern Star Trek are not adults. They're all stereotypical millennials who think their way of thinking will last forever. That intelligence equates to truth or maturity. It's in a million different things, big and small, of which you probably talked about. It's how they treat their superior officers and authority. It's how everyone has to act and talk to certain people. Their behavior is not just how the real world works, especially in military or even professional environments, just how they think it should to suit their sensibilities. Yes, Star Trek was a fictionalized drama, but it was light years ahead, no pun intended, of what it is now in terms of realistic interpretation of the real world. It's a million different things, and I can certainly not find a single episode where the writing can match the themes and ideas they tackled in their day. I can't see this modern Star Trek making something like the drumhead, or delivering a speech to rival McCoys from Balance of Terror, or for this Picard to stand for what's right, irrelevant of how it would be perceived by the modern sensibilities. Something I'm very fond of saying is that they tackled racism in the 60s, you know, when it took real balls to do so. Star Trek was about how far we would go and what we were capable of. Stories of morality played out by those who have the moral fiber to face those challenges. This is not that. These people are not our moral betters. If anything, there are our lessers, which I'm sure makes for great trash television, but it certainly won't leave a lasting impression, much less a legacy that lasts for decades. No, I don't think Mr. Roddenberry would approve of what has been done to his franchise, and if he were with us today, it's very possible that he'd be jeered and attacked for not falling in line with whatever the internet demands of him. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it a standard war tactic to either destroy or assimilate things of cultural value of the conquered? To devalue or change around their culture is to suit the needs of those that won? Didn't the Greeks make up stories of Zeus mating with the goddesses of the conquered people? I know this is all over the place. This isn't something I planned to make. It was just a whim. With the news that this is how things will be and possibly even deteriorate to worse... This thing I often just randomly ponder came to mind again, and I wanted someone to talk about it. It's probably a borderline raving, lacking focus, but I hope you'll indulge me, and thank you for your time. Well, Umberto Hernandez, I do. This was a great rambling thing. You know, here's what I think is so interesting about modern Star Trek and storytelling. It seems to me that the great science fiction writers would ask themselves, what if... What if, like, like, and then they would come up with a premise, like, what if a giant space amoeba invaded our galaxy and it was like a disease? What if that were possible? What if, the great what ifs, they ponder. I think Star Trek is based on, I want to tell a story about race relations, or I want to show a gay character, or gay characters in a relationship. They don't ask themselves, what if? Like, I would presume in this century, let's say you want to tell a story about what, is it, what does it mean to be gay? Well, I think that story shouldn't be about that. You should ask yourselves, okay, what if... Um, if I were going to tell a story about two gay characters, and by the way, David Gerald tried to do this in a script he wrote for the first season of Next Generation, I would have two, char two characters, say Stamets, you know, or maybe... Um, just say, let's say people we don't know. You introduce two gay characters. The fact that they're gay is matter of fact. But what you do is you put them through the ringer. You put them on a planet where one of them is going to die. And you see how much they love one another and how much they sacrifice for one another. The fact that they're gay, it's not about that episode. It's not about that. The, the episode is going through some kind of a crucible on a planet you see that these two people love each other as deeply as anyone else. And through facing death, that's what the story should be about. You shouldn't just have a token gay character to have a gay character. Tell me a story that's set in a science fiction concept, a, con a context that shows two gay characters going through the same thing straight characters would go to, through a black characters that would go to. Tell us something about their humanity, not about the fact that they're gay. You know, these two people are in love. It doesn't matter what gender they are. It doesn't matter that they're 
they're same sex characters. What you're going to see is going through this crucible where one of them is going to lose their lives. You see how much they're willing to sacrifice for one another. You show that their love transcends any gender, any perception of the of culture. These are two people that really love one another. And their love, one of them loses their life, but the other one survives because if that love didn't exist, they both would have died. There's your science fiction story. There's your Star Trek story. Show me that. Don't show me two gay characters getting up and brushing their teeth in the morning. How is that a science fiction show? How is that a Star Trek story? Ask yourself all the time, is this, do we ever see a character in the original series brush their teeth? Why would you waste valuable storytelling time showing this? Is that the only way you can show a gay couple is if they get up in the morning and they're brushing their teeth having a conversation? You know what I would do if I was a script reader? I'd be like, well, get rid of that scene. You know, transpose that same scene into a science fiction concept. You can have two gay characters brushing, or two any characters brushing their teeth at a sink in any, any, why do that? Why waste valuable Star Trek time putting a scene like that in your script? That's bad science fiction bad science fiction and yet we get that all the time on star trek i don't know why i do not know uh let's see you know what i'm gonna jump in and see what you guys have to say over here because uh it's been a while now i think i'm gonna go back i think there was somebody that wrote in uh yesterday yes uh, Nick Parrish sent in a tip yesterday and says, What's up, Rob? So I listened to you and John Campia ponder if Shang-Chi will be postponed or not. And I agree at this moment it's 50-50. But if Suicide Squad makes 55 to 60 million this weekend, despite streaming, Disney's doubling down unless NYC or LA limit seats. I, I think so, probably. Look, I think people are coming around. I think more people are going to get vaccinated. I can't believe that only 50% of the country is vaccinated. Uh, and and by the way, I understand for the people that might object to getting a vaccine, is this vaccine, does it have full FDA approval? It does not. But it's not like they just made it up. They've been they've been uh, they've been working on these kinds of viruses to 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 or viruses. They've been, wor they've been working on the viruses, too. They've been working on vaccines um, to combat SARS like viruses for a long time. So th this was uh, an adjunct of that research. <clears throat> but yes, according to the FDA, they won't be finished with, with trials even until 2023. So I do understand, but it is working. It's not like you're pumping your veins full of something that, well, we don't know what the side effects are. But I mean, it's being proven out to be pretty safe. But again, it's everyone's own choice. But um, you know what? During a pandemic, you don't want to, you don't want to be a disease incubator. Calvin Bowles, our friend Calvin, who has, of course, our young Braxton, who's a, a budding imagination connoisseur. Is Braxton seven yet? Is he still six? Calvin says, Braxton just watched RoboCop. Bruh. You're showing Braxton RoboCop? He's six. My kind of dad. Uh, Braxton just watched RoboCop and loved it. But he asked if it was only a demo. At the, If it was only... If it was only a demonstration at the board meeting, why did they put bullets in the ED-209? <laughs> this is why I love Braxton. Always, always right on point with the questions. That's a really good question, Braxton. And I don't know. Why did they put live ammunition in the ED-209 to take out that poor executive? Uh, good question. I don't have an answer for you. Maybe they just figured that nothing like that would happen. Uh, or maybe that's just the world they live in. But yes, that is a very good point to make. Willow writes in. I have another Willow letter, by the way. Willow writes in and says, How did you feel about the Enterprise finale? Personally, I think it would have been much better if the episode order had been changed with These Are the Voyages coming out first and Demons and Terra Prime being the series finale instead. Willow, truer words are never spoken. As you know, I worked on documentaries for the Enterprise Blu-rays. And that's one of the big regrets both Rick Berman and especially Brandon Braga have, that they made that the last episode of the show. I agree it was a terrible place to end the series. And I think that Demons and Terra Prime are the, in the very best tradition of Star Trek. Plus Peter Weller, what a great guest star. And I think they should have ended it as a three-parter because uh, it is a talk about an episode, something that's about 
uh, diversity and, and interracial mixing and having children and amazing. And I, I love Demons and Terra Prime. And you're absolutely right. They should have done exactly that, which is amazing they didn't. Rrm, the lovely Rrm, sends in a tip. Thank you. Rrm. Mexican Iron Man. Hello. Listening in while at work. Thank you for all you do and have done for us fans. Hail, Brother Rob. Hail to the great Post Geek Singularity. Hail to the great Mod Wrenches. Long live the Post Geek Singularity. I agree, Mexican Iron Man. Mexican Iron Man is a good man. I already read the Midnight's Edge. Thank you, by the way, for that, guys. Uh, oh, I didn't see this. Uh, says, hi, Rob and Paul. Well done and can't wait to see this documentary. I want to continue the positive vibe. Everybody, please be kind to one another. Yeah, we're all going to be dead soon enough, so why not be kind? Julius, the official sommelier of this channel. Julius Goodwin is here. Haven't seen you in a bit. So just want to check and see how you were. Anything new? Well... Got Tango Shalom coming out. Maybe it'll come your way. Everything's pretty good. I mean, Elizabeth's still in school. We want to start whining about movies so we can end the film festival finally and um, give out the awards. But other than that, things are good, you know. Hopefully the Delta variant will be suppressed. California's kind of crazy. But anyway, um, yeah. Thanks for... I hope things are good with you, Julius. I hope things are good with you. Uh, Brendan Sheehy sends in a tip and says, I think I now realize the secret sauce of the original Matrix. It's because the Wachowskis strove for it to be the best in every facet. Best sci-fi movie, best action movie, best mind bender, coolest look, ace SFX, a rad soundtrack. How rare is this alchemy? Well, I'll tell you something, Brendan. The Wachowskis did a lot of preparation. When they walked in to try and sell their vision to Warner Brothers. They had manga. They had artwork. They had all kinds of things. Where's my... I've got my Art of the Matrix book. Where is it? Somewhere here. Um, my Art of the Matrix book. They did so much prep work that they dazzled everyone because a lot of the executives didn't get the script. They're like, wait, what? But they had so much artwork and it was clear they knew exactly what they were doing. But that's exactly what, what was going on. Now, here's the problem. Uh, when you work on a television show and you're just writing scripts, that's all you do. You know, I think the real problem with Star Trek is maybe Ma uh, Michael Chabon or Chabon um, wanted it to be that way, but he was just a writer. He wasn't a TV producer. The Wachowskis were filmmakers, so they could control all of that. That's why The Matrix is so good. That's exactly right. Unfortunately, not a lot of people in Hollywood are as talented or, you know, the reason you're not a holistic filmmaker, James Cameron is. You know, he's an artist, he's a designer, he's a special effects artist himself. He knows how to do everything, so when he's making a movie, his vision is on every facet of everything. Steven Soderbergh uh, shoots, he's his own cinematographer and his own editor. The Coen brothers edit their own movies, they direct their own movies, and they write their own movies, although there might not be Coen brothers movies anymore, at least with both of them. So, yeah, that's what, that's what real filmmakers are. They, they're holistic in their understanding of... That's where we get great movies from. So you're absolutely right about that. And I think it's very rare. The alchemy is very rare because there's not a lot of people that know all of those things. I, I would say David Fincher is another one that does. Remember, he was David Fincher was an effects uh, David Fincher was an effects cameraman on Return of the Jedi when he was 18. Yes, sir, he was. Our friend Royce Freeman. Hello, Royce. Thoughts on the chances Henry Cavill in the flesh or in Black Ad oh in <laughs> thoughts or chances on Henry Cavill in The Flash, which is now being reported, or Black Adam. Some folks on Flash have said he was on set. Well, he does have the same agent as Dwayne Johnson, so maybe I would love it if they were in the movie. I mean, it makes sense. Why not? I think it'd be great. Um, Brendan Sheehy says, Rob, I think the general consensus amongst the Bond fan community on the Brosman Bonds is the, fo is the following. GoldenEye's great. Uh, Tomorrow Never Dies is mediocre. Twine is mediocre. Die Another Day is very bad. Does your opinion on the Brosnan era differ much from this? Do you have love for them? I think um, I think that um, um, Golden Eyes is really good. I don't know if it's great. It's really good. I think Tomorrow Never Dies is pretty good. I don't. I don't think Tomorrow Never Dies is mediocre. I think that they they cut a lot of it out because it was running long. Like the Stamper character had the, his 
the pleasure and pain centers of his brain reverse, which they use later for Robert Carlyle and The World Is Not Enough. And I like The World Is Not Enough. I don't think either there I don't think either World Is Not Enough or Tomorrow Never Dies are mediocre movies. There's mediocre elements to them, but for the most part I like them overall. I think Die Another Day is very bad, but I like scenes in it. I love the sword fight. I love the opening Korea or North Korea. Uh, so that's kind of what I think. Uh, Dune's Butthole Monster sends in a tip and says, Do you think it's likely that ScarJo's lawsuit will prompt WB to negotiate a favorable day and date release for Dune with both Denis Villeneuve and Legendary? I want Denis to direct a sequel. I do too. Laugh out loud. Aaron's, Aaron Cummings called the Sandworms butthole monsters well that's you know in a way spoiler alert where do you think that the spice is kind of like their shit <laughs> sort of um so maybe they could be butthole monsters no i think that look they want dune to come out theatrically i know they're going to do it day and date i think they're going to do something i think they're going to do something roger h sends in a thumbs up super chat Raj h thank you sir thank you Raj. actually i'll give you back two thumbs up thank you for that i mean they might do that i it depends where we're at i i i wish dune would go day and date to theaters only for a while preferably with a major imax release because that's how i want to see it the jughead says hi rob louise x and the rest of the audience good shout out to louise x sparrow there i love that um the movie theaters have reopened over here in the uk loved the summer of soul and black widow I know we have to keep safe, but I would like to, and continue, uh, you cannot replicate the cinema experience at home. I agree. Love and respect from the UK. Well, thanks, the Jughead. I appreciate that. Uh, Jimon, Di- Jimon, you're so generous, sir. You're, you're so good to me. Thank you so much, Jimon. I very much appreciate that. Jimon says, good evening, Rob, and the Post Geek Singularity. My dad and I have been uh, currently watching Columbo. Oh, man. I have to say that I've become a massive fan of Peter Falk and his one-liners. Here's one to cheer you up. My wife says I'm the second smartest. She claims there are 80 guys tied for first. Uh, Man, you know, you got to love Columbo. Jimon, uh, thank you, by the way, for generously supporting the channel. I got one for you. One of my favorite movies in the world is Vim Vender's fantasy epic, not like Lord of the Rings. It's an introspective fantasy called Wings of Desire that was remade as a City of Angels with Meg Ryan and, and Nicolas Cage. I love Wings of Desire. Love it, love it, love it. It's a very difficult movie to watch, I'll be honest. Uh, it requires a whole different mindset. It's more like watching a poem, but it's one of my favorite movies of all time. But Peter Falk is in it, and that's all I'm going to tell you. But... Uh, it made me love it even more. I'm a huge Peter Falk fan. I love Columbo. Congratulations for looking back into the past and watching something that is awesome. Simon sends in a tip and says, Dear Rob, I too share in your frustration with New Trek. I don't have a problem with a female lead character and not a problem with LGBTQ people. I do have an issue with the writing of the female lead being a Mary Sue and sexually being pushed almost... Every episode, respecting the woke agenda. I'd like to know other members of the Discovery crew, and I see how Berman, Berman, Berman deals with a loss or injury. Michael. Michael. Um, Berm, why am I drawing a blank on her last name? It's not Berman, though. It would be nice to see a light on special effects that deals with... It, it would be nice to see, to see light on special effects episode that deals with character study. Uh, Michael Burnham... Michael Burnham, Mikey, Bur- Mikey Burnham, I I agree with you. I mean, there where are the bottle episodes? I I, I don't know. I, I I don't feel I'm watching an ensemble show when I'm watching Star Trek. It's really unfortunate. I totally agree with you. Um, and it's a bummer. It's a bummer. I just want to see one. I want to see one good story I can recall. There's not. I vaguely they. I remember certain things they've done. Like the whole thing about the burn, even calling something the burn, how'd the burn, the burn, the burn, the burn this. Nobody would call it that, the burn. I mean, that's like calling everything the big one. We talk about seismic activity along the San Andreas Fault, and we call it the big one, yeah, but it's, I, I hate it so much. I, can't, I just can't get into it. Uh, Brendan Sheehy says, 
Rob, I always get a chuckle at the end of RoboCop when Robo plunges his arm spike into a wall of shiny 80s hardware and the relevant recordings on his visor immediately appear on all the screens, both quaint and yet incredibly functional and advanced. You know what? Um, I just happen to have sitting here my, my one-sixth scale uh, RoboCop's gun. It's true. Uh, I need to re reunite uh, him with my Hot Toys RoboCop figure. Or reunite it. He who should resign now. What would have been real progressive and unexpected is if Spock in 09 was instead having a sexual relationship with his mom. <laughs> I'm sure there are probably species and characters in the Star Trek universe who are into incest and other wokeness. Now, come on. No, I don't think the natural order of things is to, despite what you might see on Pornhub, I don't. I, I know it's always stepmother. Um, I don't think that 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 is the natural. That's not where our species is going to go, you know. But it would have been interesting to see Spock in a relationship with a truly alien life form that might not even have been humanoid. I don't know. I mean, that that could be interesting. Could be. Um, William Everall. Hello, William. You're still here. It's good to see you. Uh, Stubble McShave says you talked about Blue Beetle and Booster Gold earlier. I never read those comics. When I first heard of the Blue Beetle and Booster Gold, I wondered if they were making a Herbie spinoff movie. Oh, they were not. They were not. Um, yeah, no, they weren't. Fernando, Fernando Barrero is here. Hello, Fernando. Hi, R&B. Have you ever watched the 1971 car chase film Vanishing Point? I love Vanishing Point. Uh, I own it on Blu-ray. Vanishing Point is a great early 70s road movie that everybody should see. It's a great film. I really like it a lot. Uh, you just got the Blu-ray from abroad. Yeah, you, can you not get it anymore? Um, uh, that's a bummer. Didn't Criterion put out Vanishing Point? Maybe it was Kino Lorber. Somebody put out Vanishing Point that was, hang on, let's consult the old internet. Now I want to know. Blu-ray. Let's see. Uh, no, it's. I don't want to see a fountain pen. Uh, let's see. Blu-ray. Um, yeah, here's the vanishing point that I have. This is not... 90 bucks! Yo! Yo! Wow, That I guess that's a rare Blu-ray. Um, wow. That's the, that's, that's the one that I have. And, and of course, uh, Barry Newman, who is... Um, uh, in uh, The Shining. Uh, you know what I was thinking of Tulane Blacktop? That's what I was thinking about. Man, I'm not parting with my, my uh, Vanishing Point Blu-ray. No way. But Vanishing Point's great. I love it. Uh, you know what's funny? Vanishing Point, I do think of it along with Tulane Blacktop and Dirty Mary Crazy Larry. That's kind of my unofficial Blacktop trilogy. So, yeah. Um, good stuff. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize it was it's out of print. That's why I buy my physical media. Um, I guess, Fernando, that makes you... Oh, Tango Shalom. Tango Shalom is going to be opening. We don't know which theaters in New York City it's going to open yet at, but it is going to open on September 3rd. And by the way, tell everyone you know. Take everyone you know. My The future of my life, literally, is in the hands of the New York opening. we got to pack the theaters... Uh, don't worry, you'll hear all about it. All hands on deck about that as uh, we come up to the... I'm sure all going to be so sick of Tango Shalom. But don't. you know what? You don't have to hear about Tango Shalom ever again after after that until it goes on to VO after October 29th. That's it. And on that note, everyone, I'm going to end Rob's Observations episode 730. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank everybody for generously supporting the channel the way you have. Very nice. Thank you so much, everyone. Letters. I got a lot more to get through. Don't worry. Tomorrow, I'll bang out a lot more. Um, maybe I'll just do like an all... I'll have some topic, but an all-letter show. There's so many people, uh, and I will get through them. Um, so, yes, I have a lot. And I want to thank my moderators, the Blue Wrenches, Bunyan Snipe, Brian Hepburn, Louise X. Sparrow, uh... I don't know who else. I don't know if Joshua Levesque is here. Justin Toner is here. All of you, I don't know if I missed somebody. I want to thank all of you. If I missed one of you, I, I apologize. I love you being a blue wrench. Thank you for that. 
And on that note, I will say remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to everyone after this long stream, have a better day.